All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are here, and uh, I'm here with Jocko Willink of Extreme Ownership, How U.S. Navy SEALs Lead and Win. I'm really excited to read this because I really enjoyed your podcast with Tim Ferriss. And I've seen you around the UFC a bunch of times, but uh, I, n- I didn't know much about you. Um, but you're one of those dudes, you know, where I look at this guy, I'm like, that guy probably knows some shit. There's just something about you, like when I see you, you know, you're hanging around with Lister. I saw you uh, a few times at the UFC. I'm like, that guy probably knows some shit, or he's seen some shit. And then I saw the, or listened to the Tim Ferriss podcast, and I go, okay, well, that makes a lot of sense now. Uh, if you haven't heard that podcast, it is excellent. And uh, you're the one, the first guy ever to come with your own notepad and your own pen, too. I just want to point that out. Just trying to be prepared. <laughs> well, that's your whole thing, man. I'm a big fan of your uh, social media posts, too, because uh, I like feeling like a lazy fuck whenever I look at your social media posts and you have a picture of your watch, 4.45 in the morning, this dude's out there working out. I like it. Yeah, it's interesting because, uh, you know, I obviously had zero social media presence like three months ago or whatever the case may be and tim ferris was you know basically said hey you need to get on this social media stuff and i said okay can you kind of show me what to do and he says yeah sign up so then i signed up and then he dropped that podcast that gets listened to by a bunch of people and all of a sudden i was engulfed in the social media world and i found twitter to be the one that uh was the easiest to use and you don't have to write a lot so, you know, I don't like people that talk a whole bunch without yeah. saying anything. So I figured that one's pretty cool. Yeah, that was the, th- the thing that I was thinking when he was encouraging you to use social media. I was like, a guy like you, you're not a peacocker, you know? And there's something about social media that as a person who's an avid social media user, there's some peacocking to it. You know, and I try to do it with humor and I try to because it's it's an important aspect of promoting comedy shows and podcasts and things along those lines. But uh, you were much more of a keep it to yourself. Like one of the things that I loved about the Ferris podcast, you were talking about um, how you would have uh, commanders would come to uh, various leaders and ask them, what do you need? What do you need? Uh, and guys would have all these requests and all these things. We need Wi-Fi. We need this. And you were like, we're good, sir. We're good, sir. And the idea behind that is when you did need something, if you really did need something, someone would come to you. Yeah. You you would get it quickly. Absolutely. When I when I needed something and I spoke up and said, Hey, hey boss, this is what I need and this is why I need it, they would instantly give it to me because they knew that I was telling the truth, that it wasn't some, you know, half ass request that wasn't real. It was something that we legit needed and they'd give it to me. Well, this is the value of someone who keeps their words short and means what they say and says what they mean and doesn't have a lot of bullshit involved in their vocabulary or, in, and this is coming from a professional bullshitter. <laughs> I mean, this is what I do. I, I bullshit. I talk, you know, fill a lot of hours of just shooting the shit about nonsense. Yeah. You know? And I mean, I, I have to, you know, look in the mirror myself. I mean, I just wrote with my, with my partner, Leif Babin, who I served with, you know, we just wrote a 300 page book about us, you know, for all practical purposes. Now, of course it's about our team and it's about what we learned and what we experienced, but There's no doubt that there's some level of, you know, self-promotion when you're writing a book that's got your name on the cover of it. And and now I'm sitting here talking to you, and I guess that puts me in the same uh, league. (laughs) Maybe not the same league, but at least I'm playing the same sport. Yeah, we're definitely playing the same sport. But but there's benefit to that because I think what you have to say, and especially what you had to say in the Tim Ferriss podcast, is is very important. It's... um, it's not just important, it's unique. And because your perspective is of one who was involved in the most intense activity a human being can participate in in today's world. You were involved in combat in Iraq during the worst time of the war, and you came through it with some pretty intense lessons. And you can, I think anybody listening to that podcast can get a lot out of it. There's inspiration. To be gotten from that podcast for sure but there's also uh, an understanding that can only be i don't think anybody else can relay what you experienced but you you know you can have all these guys that write these you know movies and they could write screenplays and television shows about it or guys can write books about it embedded journalists can write about it it's not the same it's not the same i got a sense from just you talking about it 
on Tim Ferriss podcast, literally a shift in my perspective of what it's like to be there. Yeah, it is, you know, for me, it was my, and I know this might sound weird, but it was my lifelong dream to be in combat and to be in a leadership position in combat. Ever since I could remember wanting to do anything of any substance with my life, I wanted to be some kind of a commando. And so I, I really felt, and, and the Battle of Ramadi was, uh, you know, like you said, it was 2006, it was Ramadi, Iraq, it was the worst place in the world at the time. And I knew that, and I felt like my whole life had sort of been preparing me to be there in that position, taking care of those guys to the best of my ability and going out and, and sending them out to go and kill the enemy and supporting the conventional forces that were there that were unbelievably brave and humble and just miraculously patriotic. And we formed a brotherhood that, you know, to this day, I, I don't think it'll ever be replaced. And you can see why, you know, these stories of war stand the test of time. I mean, we talk about the Peloponnesian Wars. We talk about war for all time because there's, there's something there. And I think it's what you began with because it is the ultimate human test. You know, it's the ultimate. It is other people are trying to kill you and you're trying to kill them. And that's just the ultimate test. And not that it's a great test or a test that everyone should want to have happen because it's it's awful and horrible and wretched in many ways. But at the same time, it's there and it's present and there is no avoiding it. There is no avoiding it. War is part of the world. It's part of human nature. I know Dana White, you know, says fighting's in our DNA. Well, you don't have to go but one or two degrees further from fist fighting to where, you know, tribes of human beings are trying to kill each other. Yeah, it's one of the subjects that I've talked about with my friend Duncan. We were we were going over this and we, we essentially came to the conclusion that the history of the human race is a a history of military warfare. I mean, whenever you talk about the human race, you talk about the Civil War. You, you talk about, you know, World War One, World War Two, Korea, Vietnam. You talk about wars, and in between those wars, people preparing for more war or trying to avoid war, the Cold War, in between wars. You know, you talk about the, the various conflicts throughout history, whether it's Genghis Khan or whether it's Napoleon, or whether you're talking about war. I mean, almost all of our history has been trying to keep people from fucking with us and trying to take things that we think will help our people. That's essentially the history of the human race. Yeah, and I think what really strikes people and why there's a, a, an almost sick fascination with it in some ways is because there it's you know we say that uh combat is like life but amplified and intensified so it's similar to regular life except for the consequences are obviously everything you know you you can die that can be the end of you and so when you're in that moment and when you read about that and when people read these books or watch these movies they get some sense of what that must be like. And I think that's why there's, like I said, some uh, attraction to it. I mean, that's why war, there's hundreds and hundreds of war movies and hundreds and hundreds of war books because people try and understand what that emotional content really means. Well, there's no higher stakes. So anytime you're, you're involved in an activity that literally there are no higher stakes other than the loss of your loved ones and the grief that you would suffer because of that, the loss of your own life is about the highest stake possible. And when... I talk to people like you or many of the other guys that I've talked to that have served and been involved in combat. One of the craziest aspects of it is many want to be back there. Many experience that life tuned up to 11 and they, they recall it like it's the best time of their life. There's no doubt about it. Best time of my life. No That's doubt about crazy. It. No doubt about it. Feeling that pressure. Um, knowing what was at stake and again for me in a leadership position you know everyone feels a little bit different for me in a leadership position you're not worried about yourself getting hurt or killed you're worried about your guys getting hurt or killed and that's the most important thing and the thing that's keeping you awake at night and the thing that's driving you and so, so 
there's an intensity there. But having so much pressure and so much at stake, when it goes away, it's definitely leaves a, a hollow, empty space inside. There's no doubt about it. Well, you see it with fighters, with uh, boxers, MMA fighters. When they retire, they have a real hard time finding regular life to be fulfilling. And I could only imagine it would be way more intense because of war. Because the thing about fighting is it's such a solitary sport. You know, you have your team behind you, you have coaches, you have guys that you prepare with, that you train with. But once you're locked up inside that cage or you step inside that ring, it's really all just about you. The experience is yours. When you're at war, your experience is protecting all those around you as well as staying alive and losing friends and thinking that you could have done something differently and maybe someone would still be here that's that's a completely different kind of thing to leave and to come back to regular civilization and then to watch all the shit that you did in iraq go to pieces now you watch just fucking chaos over there now. Every day in the news, the, 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 whether it's the, the civil war between the Sunni and the Shia, or whether it's what's going on with ISIS, and it just seems like whatever gains that you guys made there are slowly being eroded every day. Does that also, like, pull at you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So, you know, like I said, we fought, and when I say we, I'm talking about a giant group of 5,000 or 6,000 Americans or the 1-1 AD, just a huge group of awesome guys, soldiers and Marines, and we were a part of them. And so they, they, we all fought very hard for the city of Ramadi. I mean, this is, it's a city. It's a city like a city in America. It's a, you know, it's got roads and it's got houses and it's got building and it's got a government center. And it's got a soccer stadium. It's a city like what we have in America. And we went in there and fought to take this city back from these savages that owned it at the time. And why do I call them savages? It's because they tortured people, they skinned people alive, they beheaded people, they raped little girls and little boys. It was just disgusting. And so we went in there and fought against them and beat them. And what we did in doing that is the people that actually lived there. Again, this is a city with human beings in it. And I always have to tell this story, or at least relate to people, that you'd be running down the street, there'd be guns firing around, and you'd kick open the, the door to a compound to somebody's house. And you'd get in there, and there'd be you know a guy, a dad working on a car, and there'd be two kids kicking a soccer ball, and there'd be a mom cooking lunch. And so there's people there. And those people wanted us to be there and wanted us to defeat the insurgents that were terrorizing them. And we did. And they were joyous about that. And so when you talk about what do I think now when I see ISIS, the black flag of ISIS, I mean, is there any other more dramatic image than I could tell you than that the black flag of ISIS now flies at the government center of Mahdi? It's, it's, it's horrible and it's sickening. And they went around and anybody that had had anything to do with the coalition there, they went around with a list of names and they murdered all of them and all their families. And, you know, we... We, as a country, we kind of left them hanging. And it's, it's horrible to see that. We left them hanging and we instigated a lot of crazy shit when we took Saddam Hussein out of power, which was probably ultimately a good thing to get rid of that guy. I mean, there was no question that he was a psychopath and his sons were evil fucks. But in creating that vacuum, like when the leadership is gone, you you kind of have a responsibility to manage that area now as crazy as that sounds like people want to say we're not in the building we're we're not in the uh, the business of nation building we're not we're not in the building process or the um the uh, the business of organizing or structuring a, a nation building a democracy out of one which did not have one ever but you kind of have to well look what we did in germany and japan yeah 
we're still in both those countries. Yeah. We stayed there. And guess what the two, you know, what are the two economic superpowers behind America? You know, I, I know those two are both in the top five. Germany's definitely the head of Europe, you know, besides China. But Japan, those are economic superpowers. They're very successful countries. And we formulated their new structure. Now, there's a lot of resistance in this country. There always was a lot of resistance to going to Iraq in the first place because people didn't understand the connection between 9-11 and Iraq, and it seemed like it was manufactured. It seemed like to people on this side that, you know, we're looking at it and we're looking at Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld and all these chicken hawks that wanted us to go over there. And why? But once you're there, you, you kind of have to have a different approach, don't you? Well, there's no doubt you have to have a different approach. You have to believe in what you're doing. And again, when you're number one and, and every, every soldier or Marine or service member will tell you that when they're in combat, they're not thinking about, you know, the strategic mission of the United States of America. They're thinking about the guy that's next to them and what they're going to do to keep that, keep their buddies alive. And that's, that's all there is to, and that's true. And any, anyone will tell you that. But that being said, when you come back from that operation, and you have time to think about what you're doing there, then you've got to believe in what you're doing. And if you don't believe in what you're doing, then you're going to have some serious issues. And so for me, you know, it, it was pretty obvious that what we were doing was, was absolutely the right thing. I mean, you've got insurgents there that were foreign fighters that want to kill everyone in America. They hate us. They want to destroy us. They want to do 9-11 over and over again in this country. They want to kill us all. And so for us to be there fighting them, I am totally on board and was on board and remain that way today. Now, these insurgents that came into these places like Ramadi and were taking over the city and killing all these people and torturing all these people, why were they doing that to them? It's the same, it's the same thing that ISIS did when they went back. I mean, they want to have a chunk of land. At the time, they, they'd said that Ramadi was going to be the, the seat of their caliphate. It's going to be the, the capital city of their caliphate. That's what they were trying to do. So in a sense, like once war started over there, it became a holy war. Yes, and it's a holy war, but it's interesting because the people of Iraq, there's people in Iraq, most people in Iraq, when you talk to them, they're normal people that want to have a job, you know, build a new addition on their house, fix the roof, uh, get some good food for dinner that night, raise their kids so that they can take over the family business or whatever. That's what they want. They're, they're not a bunch of people running around doing what ISIS is doing. But who is the powerful force in, you know, in Iraq right now? Now everyone's scared of ISIS. And, and one thing about this is they're, you know, because Iraq is... They don't have this kind of patriotic feeling that we have in America, which I know I know it may be dying in many cases, but there's a lot of Americans that still believe America is the greatest country on earth, and that and even if you don't believe it's the greatest country on earth, and even if you see it for all the all of its faults that it has, you appreciate the fact that in this country you have freedom, and so you can kind of fight for that no matter what you're thinking about. You're you're fighting for freedom. You're fighting to protect your family. Well, in Iraq, they're like, okay. Um, I'll, I'll fight for whoever I'll, I'll fight for whoever or support whoever is just going to allow me to live. They, they don't have the same attitude. That's why when ISIS came into Ramadi and the, the Iraqi troops kind of ran away, they're like, well, we don't know what's going to happen. We don't really, they don't have that core belief that they're fighting for. And so I think that's where some of the challenges come in. And as they grow that, they will they will perform better, but it's definitely going to take you know a quite a bit of time. Well, I think patriotism in America was at its all time high around September 11th. Right, right after that happened, you you never saw more flags. I mean, I remember driving down the street and every car had a flag hanging from it. No doubt about it. I mean, it was uh, a buddy of mine, Jay London, sold flags. That's what he used to do: sell car flags, flags that you put on cars. I mean, I had a good business going for a while, but like a lot of things. People got accustomed to it. They got they settled in, and everything got back down to its normal level. It's so, so there's this big buzz of patriotism. Well, there's a big buzz of patriotism when you feel threatened. Mm. And we never feel threatened in America. Everyone is driving around. 
in a nice big SUV that gets eight miles to the gallon with big air conditioned blasting. They're looking at their iPhone, texting people, socially interacting through the through the Wi-Fi, and they're not concerned about their safety. And so when you're not concerned about your safety, what is there left to be patriotic when you don't understand what it means to live in fear? So yeah, September 11th comes and you get attacked and you feel that fear. Guess what? You rally around this this thing, America, that's protected you and your family, but you didn't even think about it before. But now you're thinking about it and you go, you know what? I'm going to put a flag up on my up on my vehicle, this vehicle that I drive around in complete luxury which is what America's like. America is unbelievably luxurious compared to the rest of the world. There's also unquestionable evil involved in flying planes into buildings and killing civilians, just randomly, haphazardly suicide bombing, essentially with a plane right into a building. Like all that was so evil that everybody just, there, there, was no, there was no gray area in that. It was pretty clear. It was about as clear as any event ever in human history. Agree. Now, when... You found out, I mean, you were already involved in the military when all this was going on. Yeah, I you, was. You, you signed up like long before, the, like you, if there's anybody that I've ever met that I've ever heard talk about it, that was, this, I mean, this is how you feel. You're born for this. This is, this is your, your, your goal, your post in life. Yes. What, pu- what pulled you into that? You, you grew up in New England? I did. What part? Uh, Connecticut and Maine. Okay. Yep. So... In the sticks, I'm on a dirt road, you know, just kind of a general American. A <laughs> general American. So what what was it that drew you to it? Like, where did you develop this sense of patriotism? Well, I, I would say prior to the, the feeling of patriotism, uh, you know, I, I like I said, I always wanted to be some kind of a commando. And I would say that you, when you join the military, I'd say people that are somewhat patriotic join the military. But when you travel around the world and you're in the military, that kind of confirms your patriotism more than anything else. Because you see what the rest of the world is like and how unbelievably amazing America is. And again, I, does America have faults? Yeah. America's got all kinds of faults. There's all kinds of things that we could do better. And there's things that we've done in the past that we shouldn't have done. And there's things that we'll do in the future that we shouldn't have done. But when you compare that with the rest of the world and how the rest of the world lives and what it means to be in an oppressed society, you know, you, you're extremely thankful to be in America. This is once you've already been in the military and already started travel. So this is just, you just had this draw towards it, almost like your destiny. To be in the military? Yeah. yeah. Yes. That's a, it's tr- strange that it just came out of nowhere. Like there was no like event in your life. It just seems like... This was just something that it was always you were always attracted to. I mean, running around the woods as a little kid with BB guns shooting each other, and that seemed like a good job. <laughs> well, and, and it's funny, you know, in SEAL teams, you don't you don't grow up. You know, you don't you continue with your childhood, uh, you know, play time for your whole adult life, and it's awesome. You know, that's the best thing about the SEAL teams is you you get to do what you always wanted to do and they pay you money and you get unlimited ammunition, unbelievable types of weapons, bombs, explosives, you know, grenades, and they just give it all to you and they say, get after it. Well, they get excited when they find a guy like you. We got a, here we got a smart guy who was born to do this, who's really looking forward to it. Like, I, it's perfect. I guess so. I'm sure the recruiter was pretty fired up when he met me. <laughs> I would be. If I was a recruiter, I'd like, Get out of the way like, and let me sign the we paper. We got one. <laughs> Check. Check the boxes. And, um, but it's, it's kind of, it's even more intense because it's not just you get to play, but only the strong get to play. The weak all get weed, weeded out, and what's left is people of similar character. That's the, what I've found most fascinating. I think that's one of the, the things that's so romantic in uh, the public's eye about the idea of the SEALs or Green Berets or Rangers, p- people that it's very difficult to get in there. And only a select few have the intestinal fortitude, the willpower, and the ability to lock on to a task and a goal and get through it. Yeah. And then when you're in the SEAL teams, none of that means anything. And, and like all the training and all that selection process, it just doesn't mean anything because you all, that's just the baseline of where everyone's at. And so when people talk about this intense training, when you're in the SEAL teams, you don't talk about that training that you go through to get in. That's just the baseline for everybody. 
And so it's just to make sure that you're not a pussy. Just exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And here and it, you are, 44 years old. You're still getting up at four o'clock in the morning doing deadlifts. <laughs> <laughs> like you ne it never left you. It did not leave me. It's not going to, is it? It is not going to. <laughs> So you you get through once you get through uh, the the in, intensity of buds and you you get through you know all the people that are going to quit and you get through all the training. What is life like from there on out? Like how structured is like training and um, physical activity and things like that from there on out? You know, again, being in the SEAL teams is is awesome. It's such a fun job that I, I literally didn't consider it a job except for maybe 13 months out of my career. 13 months I worked for uh, the directly for the admiral that was in charge of all the SEALs, and it, he's a great guy, and I learned a ton from him and from having that job, but it wasn't a fun job, and even he would tell you it's not a fun job. You know, you've got to, uh, you know, you're wearing a uniform every day, and in the regular SEAL teams, you're, you know, you're wearing a pair of shorts, and you're barely wearing a shirt because you're out there in the, in the field, you know, or you know, getting ready to go in the field. So it's a, it's a great life and you're constantly training. You're hanging out with a bunch of guys that are pretty much have the same attitude as you. For the most part, there's a couple guys that don't cut it. And there's some guys that are super studs and you're, you're doing your best to emulate them, but you're hanging out with a bunch of great guys. And, you know, when I was a young seal, we'd get to Friday and we'd, you know, go out, have a beer. We'd get done Saturday, we'd still go to work. Sunday, we'd still go to work. We'd go work out, we'd hang out, we'd work on our gear, we'd get ready, and there was even, not even a war going on. We were just into it. You know, we were just fired up for the SEAL teams. And that was, so it's a, it's a great life. And then once the war started, the intensity definitely picked up because, you know, everybody knew that we were going into combat. And everyone pushed that much harder. That being said, back in the 90s, we used to train really, really hard because there was an unknown element. You know, there was an unknown element where you didn't know what was really going to, you didn't know what combat was really like. So you trained as hard as you possibly could figure out how to train. We trained. And then once combat started and we were like, okay, well, we kind of know what we're dealing with now. It'd be like a fighter going to a camp. If he's never fought in the UFC before, he's going to train super hard to make his debut. Well, maybe after he wins really easily his first couple fights, maybe he backs off on that training camp a little mm. bit. Not that we did that, but it definitely <laughs> mentally was there uh, to, to push hard even before combat. So you're just essentially saying that even before you were going to war, you were going to be ready. You, you, yes. were, you were going to make sure that you had all your boxes checked and you had all your ducks in a row. 100%. How much physical training is there once you're actually deployed? It, it depends on where you are and what you're doing. You know, it depends on what type of missions you're going on. But, you know, being in the SEAL teams is a very physical job. And again, you know what it is? It's a baseline. Everyone expects that you're going to be able to put on your rucksack and your gear and go out and move and shoot and communicate. That's the baseline. Everyone's expected to do it. Whatever you have to do to, to make that happen is, is kind of on you. Although we do do, you know, team, what we call PT, physical training, but we do team PT. But a, a lot of it is on you as an individual or your smaller element, you know, group of guys. And that's how you you gotta you gotta stay in shape. You do not want to be the guy that you know can't carry his can't carry his weight. That's just you'll you'll get you'll get kicked out. So it's but it's not structured. It's not organized. Like say if you're deployed in Iraq. What, what I was getting at was I always wondered. Like I, I would imagine the the type of workouts that you do, they're exhausting, right? You know, you're deadlifting, you're doing cleans and presses and all this crazy shit and chin ups and running up hills. If you had to go to war right after a hard workout like that, it's going to take something out of you. Yeah, you've got to use you've got to use common sense, right? So, how do you know like when to stay in shape or what to do? Yeah, you're 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 not going to do like a massive squat workout while you're on deployment. That's going to put you in the hurt locker right. for three or four days. It's just not smart. You know, you're gonna. It's like a Pavel. You know, the Pavel Tatsuli. Yeah. You know, he kind of, I heard that from him years and years ago, you know, because he was training some SWAT guys up in L.A. And I talked to some of those guys and they said, you know, well, don't, you don't need to go to exhaustion to get stronger. So, oh, okay, cool. Let's try that. And so, you know, you've got to be ready to operate. That's your primary mission. you got to be ready to go out on the battlefield and get after it. So you're not going to crush yourself so hard that you're incapacitated. Yeah, he's not a guy that believes in going to failure, right? He's got some interesting ideas. Yeah, he doesn't, he doesn't ideas. go to failure. And yeah. I'm not like some uh, 
some follower from just mm-hmm. one of those things I heard along the way. Yeah, I mean, look, there's a lot of different philosophies when it comes to training. Um, but when you, so so when you're deployed, it's essentially all entirely on you, other than the the, the the group organized PT trainings. Just about, yeah, just about. So do you guys get together? You say, hey, we're gonna go running, or we're gonna lift today, or we're gonna let's go do some pull ups. What about um, martial arts training? How much martial arts training is involved? Again, that depends on you know what the situation is and who you're working with. You know if. <laughs> If you were a, a junior officer that was working for me, then you were going to be training jujitsu all the time. You know, if they're working for you, working so it depends on who they're working for. Yeah, uh, you know, I needed training partners, and so right. I got them. <laughs> so when you did that, um, would you take guys and teach them some basic stuff, and then just choke the shit out of them? Yeah. Is that the, yeah. the move? <laughs> Pretty much. Pretty much. Do you talk them through it while you're doing it? Like defend, get your arm here, yeah, look out. Yeah. But you know, I actually, got, I would actually improve. You know, I'd go on deployment and come back, and you know, some guy that maybe I was having good battles with before I left, I'd come back and be better because all of a sudden you go and work on really good offense against a bunch of strong, you know, psycho seals that don't want to tap and you got you got to make it work so you know i'd come back and and be better i wouldn't i wouldn't get worse on deployment that's for sure that's eddie bravo's theory he believes that the the real way to get better is not to train with people better than you but to train with people that aren't as good as you and just constantly drill finishes over and over and over again sharpen them up like a samurai sword and then when you do spar with people that are your level or better, you'll be much better just because you're constantly used to finishing. Yeah, and I think there's uh, a you know, combination of both. You've got to train with yeah. people that are better than you, and you've got to train with people that are worse than you. And you know, we do that in SEAL training too, where because the SEAL training that I ran before I got out was not like the SEAL training we see with the guys with the, the, the logs carrying those around or boats on the head. That, like I said, that's the basic training, and, and no one really cares too much about that once you get in the SEAL teams because it's just over. It's just to smash you in the beginning? Just to smash you, make sure, like you said, make sure that you... You're not a pussy. Exactly. <laughs> have the intestinal fortitude to, to bring it. But once you get in the SEAL teams, then you go through something called a workup, and that's when you've got SEAL platoons that are trying to work together, and we do crazy simulated combat on these guys that is awesome i mean it's it's devastating and what we we would have uh paintball um again this is like little kid stuff right you get you get awesome paintball guns unlimited paintball rounds we had this this uh like the best laser tag system that anyone could ever imagine this crazy expensive laser tag system where you could go out and fight each other with laser tag and when you were getting shot at if the rounds weren't theoretically hitting you then there was a little speaker on your shoulder that would make noises as if rounds were going over your head so that you would know to get down and there'd be explosions going off on these little speakers and then when you'd get back from these training operations the all the they have little embedded GPS's in them so you'd put it out on Google Earth and you could watch the whole battle unfold and watch what people did right and wrong and my point in this is that sometimes many times especially in the beginning when the seals weren't quite up to speed yet and they didn't know how to work together that well three or four or five opposing four seals so these are guys that are pretending to be bad guys they would kill them all they would just go out there and murder them all and as these guys got better and started to work together and the leadership started to step up and take command and and do a better job of leading then all of a sudden they the seals would start to beat the the opposing force and annihilate them what an incredible tool to learn how to organize and to to stay together and work together as a team that what did they used to do in the past well that's that's a very interesting topic because it's very similar to you know what the ufc did to martial arts because you know as you know in 1991, you know, you and I could sit here and talk and you could be a Kung Fu guy and I could be an Aikido guy and we could be like, no, my martial arts better and you could be saying the, the same thing and we, we could theoretically debate it all day long, but we'd never actually do it. And it's different. So in combat, obviously you can't, you know, we can't say, okay, let's find out which one's better and we're on the same team. We're just going to kill each other to find out. You can't do that. So the first thing that happened was simunition and that's, you know, they basically started paintball, but it's high speed paintball that you know, fits in your real gun. It fits in a real gun. Yeah, it fits in a real gun. So you take your, you, you put a new barrel on your, your standard, you know, issue weapon, and now you're shooting paintballs 
out of your real gun. You have 30 rounds, you change magazines, like very, very similar to real combat. And all of a sudden, just like a punching bag, you know, when people say, oh, the punching bag doesn't punch back. Well, when you go into a, into a house and you shoot a bunch of paper targets, they don't move, they don't shoot back. So it's, you know, guess what? You win every single time. And right. you can get pretty confident with your tactics, but your tactics aren't getting tested. And so when, when these great technologies come, came out, simunition, paintball, and these laser type systems, it was, a, it was a complete change, and we definitely changed our tactics. Our tactics evolved just like fight tactics evolved with the, with the advent of the UFC. And people said, oh, this doesn't work the way we thought it did. And, you know, this idea of, oh, we're just going to go running into a room and no one's going to stop no matter what. No, actually, if there's a machine gun just laying paint into you as you go in, you're stupid if you go run into that room. So we made these simple adjustments, but it was an interesting progression and it definitely imprinted the fact that you have to make your training as realistic as possible. And it also, it also shows you how people, humans, have a tendency to believe in what they're doing just because it's kind of what they believe in. And, you know, again, I think those, those traditional martial arts that were so popular, you know, back in the day... People truly believed that, like, no, I will actually stop you with, you know, with my chi. My chi will stop you. And they, they really thought that. I had one of my jiu-jitsu buddies was, you know, a, had some chi guy in 1995, like, you cannot take me down. <laughs> and he said, well, what do you mean? And he said, no, I, once I settle my chi, y- you cannot take me down. And he said, well, okay, settle your, do you want to try it? And the guy's like, sure, you can try all you want. So the guy, you know, stands there and settles his chi out. And my buddy goes, are you ready? And this guy says, yeah. And he just like double legs and slammed him <laughs> on the ground. But, it, but the guy believed it. That's yeah. what's crazy. And that's what, that's what people get, get lured into. You know, our egos lure us into a lot of stuff that we need to watch out for. Well, the, the belief is based on, you know, being taught it by people who also believe it too. And it's, it's so confusing because no one's experienced it in, in real life, which was why what the initial question was when they used to prepare like back in Vietnam or, you know, d- during the, uh, the first, well, when was this stuff invented? Like did, during, did they have it during the first Gulf War? Mm, barely, barely. Very small groups had it, you know, not, not as many as should. They had the laser set up and everything? Uh, no, we didn't get the good. No, they had the, they had a, a worse laser system, you know, they've been trying to do it for years. But what did they used to do like during the Vietnam era? go off the experience of guys that had been in World War II in Korea Jesus. and try and pass that on. Wow. And, and luckily, and honestly, you know, being in combat, the basic principles of combat are not these super crazy complex things. You know, the most basic principle that, that we talk about is cover and move, which is if you and I are going to go assault a building over there, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take cover, I'm going to engage that building so that the enemy can't put their heads up and while I'm shooting at the building shooting where we think the enemy are you're going to get up and maneuver into a better position once you get into a better position and you get some cover you're going to start shooting at the enemy and that's going to allow me to move once I get to a better position I'll start shooting again and we'll continue to do that supporting each other as we move to a target and then once we get there we'll kill the bad guys and it'll be it'll be done that's the most basic principle but there's times where before you know in between Vietnam which is where we had major combat and people learned that cover and move. And guys that were in Vietnam were the people that taught me cover and move. In between that time and the time when we started using simunition and the, and the lasers, the better products, we actually forgot some of those lessons. As crazy as that, that, as that might seem, we actually forgot some of these very simple, basic lessons of, of gunfighting. And so it was great to have it back. And it was, you know, when we, were, when we went to combat, finally we were m- more prepared for it. Yeah, I would imagine that kind of simulation. You're, you're calling it simunition. That's uh, the, that's, that's an actual name brand, and okay, it's and a name brand. That's the paint. Yep. So simunition is the paint, and the the laser. What is the name brand of that stuff? The one that we used was called Dits, and it was made by Saab. And I don't know. Uh, I don't, I don't even know if they still make it or if that contract's still going, but it was awesome. Yeah, I, I like your analogy to martial arts, like testing it in in, in an actual competition. Because it's, it would seem that that would be the only way that anybody would ever actually learn what mistakes not to make and how they could easily be replicated in combat. And then the repeated actions of doing those over and over again and ingraining them in your mind is probably the only thing that could 
really you could draw upon when you're in those intense situations of an actual firefight. Yeah, and there's another good comparison. I don't know if you've ever heard somebody kind of say this, but, you know, they'll say, like, let's say I train some kung fu stuff where I'm like an eye attacker and I rip your throat out and all that stuff and you train you know jiu-jitsu muay thai wrestling and boxing right so people will say that you're not ready for the fact that I'm going to poke your eyes out or you're not ready for the fact that I'm going to try and grab your throat or whatever and therefore I have an advantage and I, and that you have some kind of a training scar because you aren't used to doing that you, you see what I'm saying mm -hmm. so if like I said, if all I do is train to grab your eyes and poke your throat or whatever pressure point type attack, then that means that I'm better prepared for a street conflict. And as you and I both know, like a guy that does that versus a guy that trains in mixed martial arts, boxing, wrestling, Muay Thai, Jiu Jitsu, that guy's going to destroy this other person in the street fight. And the guy will grab for his eyes and then he's going to get his arm broken off and he's going to get punched in the head 47 times. But my point in telling that, that is that this, we had the same type of people in, inside the SEAL teams that said, oh, if you get used to training with paintball, then you're going to develop training scars from it. So you're not going to be used to your regular weapon. You're not going to be used to the recoil of a real gun. And you're going to have more courage because it's only going against paint. And while, that, while there's some small piece of truth to that, just like there's some small piece of the truth to the fact that if, if you never think about what it's like to be punched while you're doing jujitsu, well, then it's going to be a surprise for you the first time you, you are in guard with someone and they crack you in the face. There's some small truth to it, but it's not a reason to throw out, you know, that type of training. It just doesn't make sense. And the other thing that's good about it is, you know, in jujitsu and Muay Thai and boxing and wrestling, you're going live against another human being that's maneuvering on you and trying to defeat you. And when you have paintball or laser, you're going against another human being that's trying to maneuver on you and defeat you. So therefore, it's very effective in, in teaching you what real combat's going to be like. What was it like the first time you were deployed, and when was that? Uh, the first time I was deployed in 2003 and deployed to Baghdad, Iraq, and it was great. <laughs> that's not what most people would think of. They would never think of that, it, that it's, word. It's very... It, what was interesting about my first deployment to Iraq was that, again, I was so happy to be, you know, in a position where I was a platoon commander and we were doing real missions. And I was excited and, and happy about that. And, you know, that doesn't mean I was running around with a smile on my face. We had a legit job and we had to get it done. It was also a time where the, the insurgents, there wasn't an insurgency yet. We hadn't even really heard that word in 2003. And so the operations that we did were relatively simple and our tactical advantage over the enemy was good enough that we just annihilated them. You know, it was like, it was like an unfair fight, which is how you want it to be. You want to have an unfair fight in combat. And so we would go in, you know, two o'clock in the morning, we'd find out where a bad guy was in some house or some office or some building, and we'd load up our vehicles and go in the middle of the night, blast their door open with big explosive breaching charge, clear their house in about 30 seconds, grab them, grab their buddies, bring them all back, interrogate them, find out where their friends are and go out and do it again. And it was awesome. And it was awesome. And it was like a rock star deployment. We'd come home at three o'clock in the morning and be done and debrief the operation and get ready to do it the next day. We probably were in... I don't know, four or five firefights during that whole deployment, a couple ambushes, and I had one guy get get wounded, not very bad. So it was it was it was fun. It was good. And we were ready for it. Um and the contrast comes when you go to my next deployment, the next deployment to Ramadi, which was completely different. So and, we and on that deployment, everything bad that can happen to a guy in a leadership position or an element happened to us. Everything bad that could happen happened. And 
So it was it was radically different than my first deployment. So your first deployment was, uh, in a sense, a lot like what people expected the war to go like after we had experienced Desert Storm. Desert Storm, which was just this overwhelming success, just the only casualties were when that one Scud missile had hit a uh, barracks. And it was just, uh, that was what America thought war was. Like, well, this is how good we are at it right now. We just go over there and we kill everybody and we lose a, a couple people. And we're real sad about that, but we wrapped it up tight. So your second deployment, what was that like? And how did it begin? <clears throat> Well, it began with our deployment orders changing. So we were literally two weeks from going on deployment. So now my first deployment to Iraq, I was what's called a platoon commander. I had 15 or 20 guys underneath me, depending on what time during the deployment it was. And we were an assault force. We were like, we, we jokingly called ourselves Baghdad SWAT because that's what we did. I just kind of described what those missions were like. My second deployment, now I was what's called a, a task unit commander, and I had two of those SEAL platoon, platoons with 15 to 20 guys that were underneath me, and then we had another 70, 60 or 70 support personnel. So these are people that do intel, people that man the radios, people that clean and repair our weapons, and people that keep the camp running and all that. So it's, it's, it's about 100 guys but there's only 35 or 40 SEALs. And we found out about two weeks before we went on deployment, our deployment changed. Instead of going to Baghdad and really doing more Baghdad SWAT operations, we, went, we were told we were going to Ramadi. And I was, again, and people always say, you know, I, I can't believe you thought that, and I can't believe how twisted you are, and all, I can't believe what a sick individual you are, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But yes, I was extremely happy and motivated that we were going to Ramadi because it was the worst place in Iraq, and that is exactly where I wanted to be my whole life. So yes, I was fired up to go there. <laughs> it's just so crazy that, I mean, it's so counterintuitive to the way most people think. I guess so. And I hung around with a bunch of guys that thought the same damn thing as me. Let's go get these guys. Let's get after it. Well, that's why you are who you are. I mean, that's, that's why it's important to have people like you in the world. <laughs> like, this, like, there's a spectrum of human beings. There is know? a spectrum of human beings. And you're, you're on this extreme edge of exactly what you want when you have an army. If you put together a military force... You want a guy like you that has that attitude. You don't want a guy who's going to the worst place in the world and saying, why me? <laughs> what the fuck? Why didn't I become a baker like my dad? I could be making cupcakes right now. Instead, I'm shooting people. Yeah. Yeah, no, you... Uh, and, and, and the SEAL teams and the Rangers and the Special Forces does a very good job of, of attracting the type of people that you're talking about the type of people that are fired up to do that job and inc no not encouraging it and, and and growing it like you like the, the it seems like the amount of uh, camaraderie and the intensity of of the friendships and the bond the brotherhood that you develop with those people just intensifies it all yeah it's a big gang it's a big <laughs> it's a big awesome gang that you're a part of that's badass and you're a part of this fraternity this brotherhood so yeah it, they definitely fuel the fire and and i should say it shouldn't say they fuel the fire we fuel the fire we're we are the fire you know the guys that are there the guys that i worked with they're they're the fired up guys that are completely ready to do this job so you get over there you're in ramadi totally different situation than baghdad totally different situation than baghdad and immediately you realize this Immediately, immediately we were going, I mean, I think, I think we went to the first memorial service for an American within, you know, 24 hours of being on the ground there. We, my, my, my camp got attacked the, I don't know, maybe the third or fourth night that we were there. Every guy was on the roof of our building shooting back at bad guys that were shooting at us. It was, and then, and then we started conducting operations almost immediately. And the operations were just, just radically different. I mean, the enemy owned 
the the downtown area of Ramadi. They they were the dominant force down there. So whereas before, you'd be going through kind of semi permissive environment in Baghdad, meaning you know, it's a, it's a bunch of civilians and they just wanted to get out of your way. And then you'd go and find this bad guy. Well, in Ramadi, the bad guys were going to find you. And it was different. And they were everywhere. They were everywhere. Who had trained them? You know, some of them were former regime elements. So some of them were, you know, Ramadi was a, was a Iraqi military city as well. So there were some of them left over. Well, actually, a bunch of them left over. And then you had Syrians coming in, foreign fighters, uh, people coming in from all over, Saudi Arabia, Jordan. I mean, they'd come in from all over the place to, to come and engage and get their jihad on. And were they motivated because America was now occupying Iraq? Is that what was, was driving them? I think more than the fact that, that America was occupying Iraq is that they wanted to take that land. I mean, America was no longer occupying Iraq when they went in and took Ramadi this time. We were gone. We'd been gone for four years. So the occupation of Iraq was not the driving force behind this. So once you get there and once you realize right away it's different, you're experiencing casualties at a level that was unheard of in Baghdad, and you are engaging with an enemy that's very prepared and overwhelming. They're everywhere. And they did, they were similar to us, meaning they did like first world country type stuff. They had meta medical evacuation plans where one of their guys would get wounded, you'd see him get evacuated. You know, you could watch on, on the uh, screens, you could watch what was happening. A vehicle would come in and gather them up and take wounded guys away. They'd bring in reinforcements, they had communications, they did fire and maneuver, they did, you know, the same basic tactics that I was talking about, they did those tactics as well. And so it was a real well trained and well-coordinated and determined enemy was this expected well we we knew what ramadi was like um but i would say it was expected but it's hard to mentally picture what that's going to be like when you when you're going to go up against guys that are that prepared so this was tactically and as far as like the, the strategy that was involved to try to take a city like that, this was a fairly new experience for the United States military, right? We, we'd never, what other, I mean, other than what Somalia, like what other urban war had uh, the United States engaged in like this where you're in a city? Well, I mean, obviously World War II had all kinds of right. urban conflict. And in Vietnam, there was portions, you know, the Battle of Way, Way City was a huge urban conflict. Somalia was definitely urban combat, but you're right in the fact that we weren't going in there to try and stay. And that was one of the biggest differences or changes in strategies that the U.S. military had that turned the war around. And that was as the, as the insurgents grew, and this 2004, 2005, the insurgents started getting more and more unified and better and more well-trained and more organized in America. What we did was kind of go back to our strong bases. So there's bases. You got to understand this in Iraq, 2005, 2006, if you went to a base in, let's say Baghdad international airport, there's a huge U S military base. There was, you know, subway, the sandwich shop, Subway, Starbucks, these places had become little little outcroppings of America. And so what we did when the insurgency got worse and worse and worse, and also the public opinion of the war went down and down and down, and all of a sudden we're saying, okay, we, we, we're not going to, we're going to minimize casualties as much as possible. So what does that mean you do? You go back to your base. And we, we did that as a country. We kind of said, okay, we're not going to take huge risks anymore. We're going to pull back to our bases. We're going to try and support the Iraqis as much as we can and let them go out and try and accomplish missions. And we still did do missions, but we definitely had strong, had moved back to these big bases. Well, there was a guy, uh, there, there were several people, and one of them was General Petraeus. He wrote this, you know, the counterinsurgency manual. Because now, now, now what you had was you went from this idea of we were fighting kind of terrorists, and, and all of a sudden you were fighting an organized insurgency. And that was a huge strat strategic shift. And so now instead of going out and bad, grabbing a bad guy and then coming back, the, the, the new strategy, and it was implemented in Ramadi, 
by a guy named Colonel Sean McFarland was seize, clear, hold, and build, which means you're going to go into these enemy-controlled neighborhoods, you're going to take buildings, you're going to hold those buildings, you're going to build them into your own forts, and you're going to have American and Iraqi soldiers live in those enemy-controlled territories until the enemy was gone. Had that ever been implemented before? It had been implemented in Talifar in northern Iraq by a guy named H.C. H. McMaster, who's another kind of legendary uh, military army colonel at the time. All these guys are generals now because they're awesome guys. He had implemented it up there. He had actually turned that plan over to General McFarlane, and General McFarlane came down to Ramadi and implemented the plan there. But what was what was hard to understand is no one really knew about this. No one understood it. All they, all they said was, oh my God, wait a second, you're saying we're going to go into these enemy controlled neighborhoods where, where there haven't been American or coalition forces for a year, year and a half, two years. You're saying we're going to go in there. Right before we arrived in Ramadi, there was a, a road that the Marine Corps tried to penetrate down. They hit 13 IEDs in 500 meters. So 13, 13 IEDs, IEDs in 500, in 500 meters. Fo- so essentially... What, what is 500 meters is like? It's every 50 meters or so. A little less than 50 meters. What Fif- is that in football fields? How much five, foot, five, five football, football fields. fields. Yeah. That's insane. It is. Wow. So, so this new strategy to go in there and push in there was considered to be, by many people, was considered to be too risky, too dangerous, and, and really, in some cases, crazy. Like, this is a crazy strategy. We haven't been able to get down there, and now you're saying we're going to go down there and live there? So it was, uh, it was a very dynamic change. So this is a, a gigantic, gritty, boots-on-the-ground approach to taking over a city. Like, one step at a time, one building at a time. That's it? Wow. That's that, it. that had to be insane. Yeah. yeah. Is there any documentary footage of this? Were there any embedded journalists there or anything is, like there that? Were, there were embedded journalists. You know, you can go on YouTube and just Google Ramadi 2006 and you'll, you'll see some good stuff. There's a documentary that came out, I think it was on the History Channel. It's called A Chance in Hell, The Battle for Ramadi. And that, what's good about that one is it interviews a lot of the guys that we worked with while we were there. And what I was just trying to convey to you about the fact that a lot of people were saying this was a suicidal operation. You can hear these guys that were officers in charge of battalions and companies. They're saying the same thing. They they were getting told by their peers, like, this is a crazy idea, and you guys are all going to die if you go in there. Wow. Now, what is morale like when something like that gets brought down, when these are the orders and this is what you have to do, and everyone's telling you it's a suicide mission? Well, that's that's where leadership comes into yeah. play because, you know, one of the one of the toughest things that I ever had to convey to my guys was this fact that we were going to be working alongside Iraqi soldiers, conventional Iraqi soldiers. So you picture this: we oh, that that first deployment I talked about, we were we were only working with SEALs. I mean, we were SEALs. The guy to your left was a SEAL. The guy to your right was a SEAL. The guy behind you was a SEAL. The guy you knew in front you of you, could was, trust you knew you could trust them. You knew them. They were, they were your brothers. So now we get to Ramadi, and the mission changed coming down from the special operations forces that were in charge of, of all special operations in Iraq. And the new, the new mission was to – the new mission, I'm, I'm trying to think of the exact uh, – was to train and fight company and platoon-sized elements of Iraqi soldiers. Train and fight company and platoon sized elements of Iraqi soldiers. And when they say fight, that means like that's a verb saying we're going to fight with them. So all of a sudden, I'm telling my guys, hey, you, you know how you're used to working with a bunch of SEALs? You're going to now, when you go out, the majority of the guys you're going to be with are Iraqi soldiers. That's the majority of guys. Now, Iraqi soldiers are, <laughs> they're, 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 they're barely even military, I mean, people. They're just, unmotivated, poorly trained. In fact, in many cases, their loyalty is questionable. I mean, these are guys that would shoot Americans in the back. So now I'm telling my guys, okay, you're going to go out there and do this. And obviously, the first reaction I got was, uh, this, is cr- this, is, this is crap. This is garbage. Well, why would we ever do that? This is the worst battlefield SEALs have fought on since Vietnam. And you want us to go out there with a bunch of 
a bunch of Iraqi soldiers l- watching our back. That's crazy. And, and when I heard it, I thought it was crazy too. So what do you do then? What, what do you do then? You're going to send your guys into harm's way in a much more vulnerable way. And you got to get them to do it. So first of all, I had to understand what we were doing in my own mind. I had to understand why. I understand why would somebody be telling us to do this? Because it seems freaking crazy to me. So as I sat there and thought about it, I realized, you know, okay, why is, why is the president making us do this? Why is the general, the, why is the Pentagon making us do this? Why are the generals and colonels on the battlefield here in Iraq? Why in God's name would they be making us go out with Iraqi soldiers? It's crazy. And then I thought to myself, well, okay, why? Let's answer that question. Oh, newsflash. If we don't do it, if we don't get the Iraqi soldiers trained up and ready to maintain the security in their own country, then who's going to do it? Who's going to do it? Who's going to train them? And furthermore, who's going to hold the security in their country? And the answer was nobody. And the answer was us. The answer was we would be here forever because these Iraqis need to be able to get up and stand on their own two feet. And so when I explained that to my guys, like, hey, I know you don't want to work with Iraqi soldiers. I understand. I understand there's more risk. Here's why we're doing it. We're doing it because if we don't do it, if we don't get these guys up to speed, if we don't teach them how to defend themselves and how to defeat this, this enemy, they're never going to be able to do it. And we'll be mired in this conflict forever. And once, once they understood that strategic picture, they were able to get their head around it and then slowly accept what we were doing. How common were their complications for dealing with the Iraqi soldiers and did you guys have to take steps in order to to watch over them to make sure I mean you're talking about guys shooting guys in the back shooting Americans in the back did you have uh, plans in place to make sure that someone was watching them at all times like yeah yeah so yeah. you didn't you couldn't treat them like did, did someone did they speak English uh, no we had interpreters oh. and oh yeah it's a nightmare um, and, and and we would have some of the Iraqi soldiers, some of the, some of the leadership of the Iraqi soldiers would be very good. Some of the grunts would be very good and some of them would be just disastrous. And did we have to change? Yeah. They didn't, we had to change our tactics so that we didn't use the terms left and right because like they didn't understand left and right or, or no numbers. A lot of them couldn't count. I mean, it was, they couldn't count. Yeah. Yeah. So they're totally uneducated, totally uneducated. Wow. Yeah. Can't count. Mm-hmm. Holy shit. Yeah. Go four doors down. Hmm. Mm. Something you could tell a five-year-old. Yes. Whoa. Yeah. So, so that was that was definitely challenging. I think you're allowed to call them savages when they can't count. <laughs> is that the, is that the rule? If you, you know, can't count to I, four, I reserve I reserve <laughs> the term savage for somebody that commits, horrible people commits yeah. you know atrocities against human beings. You know, somebody that rapes an eight-year-old girl like they're doing wholesale doing that, and it, ISIS is doing that right now. That's part of their gig. Uh, yeah, I, re- I, I reserve the term savages for them. So what steps did you guys have to take to ensure that the SEALs and the other American soldiers were protected in working with these people? I mean, you just had to keep your eye on them. I mean, it, and, and honestly, at this point, the you saw this, this uh, happen a lot more in Afghanistan, which was the, what do they call it? They call it... Uh, I forget what they, they have a term for it, but when the when the friendly, allegedly friendly Afghan soldier turns and shoots everyone in the back, that happened more later in Afghanistan. And when we were in Iraq, it was pretty seldom that it happened, but we just had to be aware of it. We had to, you know, you always had a guy that was like sta- standing off the firing line and making sure that no one was, you know, dr- pulling their weapon out and aiming at Americans. So that was a job. Yeah, we just, you got to keep an eye on these guys. You absolutely have to keep an eye on these guys. What a crazy added element. And the other, I mean, and just, again, because there's dichotomy in everything, at the same time, you'd have some guy that was, you know, some Iraqi soldier that was willing to take a bullet for your buddy. And so it's, that's what makes war so complex and confusing is it's not cut and dry and it never is. So how did it start panning out once you started this seize... Seize, clear, hold, and build. 
it was a tough fight, basically, with every one of these combat outposts. That's what we ended up, uh, what they ended up calling these combat outposts. Every one of them was a pretty, a pretty tough fight. So they were fight. They're buildings. They're You're buildings. calling them combat outposts. Combat like, outposts. And what kind of the ten stories? Like how many stories are these buildings? Most of them were two or three stories. Two or three stories, and so you set up a perimeter around the building, yep. keep people yep. stationed in them. Yep. Guns at the windows, yep. looking out constantly. And it would be, it, we'd take the building down. And then they would do a massive construction project in the middle of a combat zone. So these army engineers, God bless them all, would roll down there with their bulldozers and their, they'd put these big concrete barriers up and they'd put sandbags in all the windows and they'd build machine gun nests on top. And wow. again, they're doing this in the middle of like mayhem. Wow. And then you'd have this secure combat outpost. And while they were doing that, this is sort of was our, our addition to this type of operation was while they were doing this big construction prog project, obviously the situation was very vulnerable for the American forces. And so what we would do is I would push our SEALs out into perimeter buildings that were maybe a 200 or 300 yards away. And so when the enemy would come to attack, we'd kill them. What a crazy scene that must have been to be taking these buildings and then reinforcing them and then turning them into military bases. And then one after others, you're doing this too. Yeah, yeah, it was it was an awesome effort, and I think a good number we put in one combat outpost, and there was they the uh, army engineers put in thirty thousand sandbags in one combat outpost. Wow. It's like three buildings, just all good things. A lot of sand out there. Yeah, no doubt about <laughs> it. No doubt about it. Wow. And so, how many buildings did you guys wind up taking overall? Uh, Probably a, probably a total of like 10 combat outposts, each one having two, three, or four buildings. And again, let me clarify, when I say we, I'm talking about this massive effort of the 1-1 AD, which is the, the 1st Brigade, 1st Armored Division, and all the battalions that were underneath them, including one uh, Marine Corps battalion. And the reason I'm, I'm pointing that out, Joe, is uh, those guys were just unbelievable heroes. They really were. They were awesome. You choked up. Yeah, these guys were these guys were awesome. They really were. Yeah, I can only imagine the uh, emotional attachment that you have to that. Yeah, it, and you know they. You know you you can look you can Google Navy SEALs and find you know twenty million news stories about them. Um and that's great but these guys you know to to have seen them uh kids you know because you know you're talking about earlier how the seals you know guys like me this is what we want to do well these guys didn't all necessarily have that attitude and as a matter of fact the guys that were in Ramadi with us when we first got there, they were reserve unit out of Pennsylvania, the 228 Iron Soldiers. They were reservists. These guys were teachers, like like what you see when they talk about these reservists. These guys were teachers and professors and, you know, bakers, and they had real jobs in the real world and wanted to get home to their family, and yet they were there grinding it out against a hardened enemy. And so, uh, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a crazy thing to see, and it's, it's very humbling. Uh, to be around people like that. It really is. How long did this battle go on, the battle for Ramadi? Well, we got there, you know, the, like I said, the 228 had been there for 14 months. 14 months on the ground, lost around 100 guys, I think 94. Um, and then the 1-1 AD came in in May and implemented... Seize, clear, hold, and build. And by the time uh, I left, October twenty first, two thousand and six, and by the by January of two thousand and seven, the battle was for most for the most part over. And these enemy attacks that had been uh, when we were there thirty to fifty a day went down to like one a day, and then one a week, and then one a month. And 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 you know I have pictures of. Probably about six to nine months after we left, we got pictures that guys sent back to us of they were running road races down 
the worst, what were the worst areas of Ramadi. They were playing soccer games. There was people out in the streets. There was guys, seals or not, not seals, but soldiers with no body armor on, just walking around meeting people. It was a, it was a miraculous turnaround. And the people of Ramadi that we had fought to support and help were were joyous and were had a stable city to live in and were you know ready to carry on with their lives see i think stories like this get left out of the mainstream narrative of course they do they most people me included just don't know about it aren't aware of it have a very insulated idea of what this war was about what happened over there and what are the pros and cons of this war and what are the pros and cons of taking a city like this and turning it into a, a relatively safe place. It, relatively, it was definitely a safe place. There was less murders there than there is in Detroit. Wow. I mean, it was it was a complete turnaround. And again, you do you can do that because the people there wanted to be stable. They wanted that. They wanted peace and they wanted freedom. And they wanted the insurgents out. They absolutely wanted the insurgents out. Do you think that most people in America have a distorted perception of, of the military in general and of the Iraq war in particular? I, I think it's hard for me to give a perspective of what civilians think, you know, right? It's, it's very difficult because, you know, it's really easy to slip into like just a straight John J. Rambo, you know, there mm -hmm. are no friendly civilians, you know, right. it's, it's really easy to get there. Uh, but definitely when I hear various, you know, people talking and you go, this person has no idea. This person has no idea. They, it's weird because they'll clump the people of Iraq. They'll clump those people together as a group. And it's the wrong, they have the wrong impression of what those people are like, you know. And, and guys that have been to Iraq and have gone into houses and talked to the, the local populace there and broke bread with them and drank their tea. You're like, oh, yeah, these people... These people definitely wanted us there. Like when I hear this thing about, you know, that they didn't want us there and we were occupying, it's like, oh, no. They, there, was, there was times where they, we'd kill an insurgent and they would cheer. They would cheer. Like, thank you. Thank you for killing that person. He was a terrorist. And he was, you know, trying to, trying to rape my daughter. They were happy we were there. What is Ramadi like now? It's been overrun by ISIS. They're, they keep saying now that there's a going to be an effort by the Iraqi military to take it back and God bless them and good luck. They would have to do the exact same thing. They're going to have to do the exact same thing. It's going to be a, it's going to be tough. It's going to and, be very tough. And without the United States military force backing them up and leading something like that, do you think that's even possible? It's going to be difficult. It is possible, but it's absolutely going to be difficult. It's going to be very difficult. That's one of the things that Again, you know, and leadership. Um, leadership is such an important thing. It's such an important thing because it really does change. It changes every variable in a situation. And so when you have good leaders, you, you can win. And I don't know who in particular is in charge of this Iraqi force that's going in there the iraqis have some very strong leadership and if they've got the right person in position they they will be able to take it back now america ha absolutely has incredible military leaders some incredible military leaders and when you when you have to step up and lead a an assault like that on a city i mean american leadership would be would absolutely make a change and would be extremely positive for the situation on the ground. Do you think that America should go back into Iraq? <clears throat> well, first of all, we're already back in Iraq. We're on the ground. We got 3,500 troops there. This is a, and I hate to answer your blunt question with a philosophical answer, but war is very difficult and very tragic and very evil in its own right and so you should be very very cautious about pulling that trigger and initiating a war because horrible things are going to happen horrible things are going to happen 
enemy are going to be killed. Friendly are going to be killed. Americans are going to be killed. Civilians are going to be killed. This idea that we're going to go into a, a war in an urban environment and we're not going to kill any civilians. No, civilians are going to die. And you have to understand that. And I, I talk about this when people ask me this question. There is two types of will that you have to have if you're going to go to war. Two types of will. One is the will to kill people. And like I said, it's going to be enemy. And you're going to focus as much as you can on killing the enemy. And some civilians are going to die. There, that is what is going to happen. And you have to understand that that is part of what you are getting into. So you have to have, you have, to have the will to kill. And you also have to have the will to die because Americans are going to die and young men are going to come home in coffins and that's a horrible thing. And so if you're going to go to war, you should be going to war with a clear vision to win to win and i think if we have the will and we have a plan on on winning then we should we should execute that plan but if we're hesitant and if we don't have the will then we should stand by until we develop that will and we can sit outside and we can shape and we can we can try and shape events which we should we should have a leadership role in the world we should be looking out for american interests i know that sounds like taboo language in this day and age but we're america and we should look out for american interests around the world that's what we should be doing and there's nothing wrong with that that's what other countries are doing they're looking out for their interests and when when we're all looking out for our own interests, there's a balance and things can move forward. So do you think right now with uh, the, the limited amount of troops that are in Iraq, it's, uh, you said 3,500 now? Yeah. At what, what was it at the height? I don't know, over 100,000. I mean, at the height, it was probably even close to 200,000. What would it take to develop that will that you talk of? Do you think that the United States needs to see some other Paris-like event? I mean, we already had September 11th. <laughs> they killed 3,000 of our people on our home soil. Um, but that was 14 years ago, and for a lot of people, that might as well be another world. True, true. Um, I, I, I got asked the other day about the warning signs, you know, to, do we, are we paying enough attention to the warning signs or are there enough warning signs? And I, you know, I, I just, I kind of shake my head. I mean, what more warning signs do you need than go watch YouTube videos and they're like, we are coming to kill you. We are going to destroy you all. That, look, that's the warning right there. The warning has been issued. Stand by. For people like me that are completely on the outside of the military, it seems like ISIS came out of nowhere. It seems like once Arab Spring started happening, we started pulling out of Iraq. All of a sudden, you start hearing about the ISL or ISIL or ISIS. No, they, Various... used, they used the term uh, ISI, which was which was IS, uh, Islamic State Iraq. They used that in, I think, 2007 was the first time they used that as they started to take uh, area over in Syria. They threw the L on the end of it you know, which is Levant, which is the historical name for that, that region. And the other one is Syria. The S is, is so the, it's the same people. Mm -hmm. It's the same people that were there and will continue to be there until we route them out. What, what I was getting at was that it, w it wasn't something that anybody here had heard about as an organized thing. We had, we had heard about insurgents in Iraq, but we had never heard of it in, in a, like with a name, like, uh, like ISIS, like yeah. now that it's a name, it's like an identifiable enemy. 
And when you're in a war against terrorism, one of the things that I think kind of freaks Americans out, especially those that don't have a connection with the military, is this idea of a war against terrorism is, is this open-ended proposition. There's no enemy. You know, like, the, or there's, no, there's no definitive end to this. Like, when Japan surrendered... World War II was over. Mm -hmm. People were kissing in the streets. That iconic image of the the sailor kissing his girlfriend in the street. That we didn't. That none of that happened for us in this country. There was no definitive ending. And when we've pulled out of Iraq and we're planning on pulling out of Afghanistan, and then we see ISIS build up and get bigger and stronger and scarier, and we see what happened in Paris, and we see what happened in Lebanon and in Nigeria, and we see these terrorist attacks, and we're like, well, wh when is, is this, is there ever going to be a point where we have an, a, a soldier and his girlfriend kissing in the street? Is there going to be an end? Is there going to be a confetti blowing in the, the main street in a parade? It doesn't seem like it. I would say that that's an accurate assessment, that it doesn't seem like it. Yeah. We, we got a long fight, you know, and, and you asked, you know, where did ISIS, how do we start hearing about them? Well, the same thing we were talking about earlier, social media. Yeah. You know, they've got social media. They're aiming it at, you know, uh, disenchanted people all around the world that can cling on to something that will give them some sort of uh, identity. Yeah. That's one of the most bizarre things about this, when you see people like these young girls from the UK joining ISIS, and you know they're escaping their country and, and going over there and joining ISIS. Like, what what is happening here? Like, how disenchanted do you have to be where that looks attractive to you? Yeah, and the, the two girls, I'm sure you saw this, and yeah. the two poster girls for ISIS, uh, one of them died three to six months ago, and then they just got the latest report on the other one that was trying to escape ISIS and they beat her to death. Yeah. The, I mean, it, unquestionably, it seems to be a growing force and a more dangerous force every day. I got, I, again, I think it was on Twitter. Someone hit me the other day on Twitter. Um, you know, this is an idea and you can't bomb ideas was the was the statement to me. And, you know, I try and avoid like getting into these massive sort of political debates or whatever. Um, Especially with 140 characters. Yeah. And that being said, um, Nazism was an idea that was defeated through military force. Slavery in America was an idea that was defeated by military force. Imperial Japan was an idea and a religion that was defeated by military force. And none of those ideas would have stopped without military force. And this is an idea that can be defeated with bombs. And this is also an idea that unfortunately in this country gets connected to all Muslims. The idea behind what these people are, do, are doing gets connected to all Muslims when in reality most of the Muslims in the world they they don't want something like ISIS to be in control they don't want to be in a perpetual state of war they don't want to have to worry about these quote-unquote savages and what they're doing yeah I mean the the ISIS has killed hundreds of thousands of well I don't know I don't know what the number is but we know that ISIS has killed thousands and thousands and thousands of Muslims you know, they went into Ramadi and killed hundreds and hundreds of Muslims that had worked in some way with the coalition forces so that they could have a peaceful city. They murdered them all. So let's say Donald Trump becomes president and uh, he listens to your podcast with Tim Ferriss and he reads your book and he goes, Jocko, I'm coming to you for advice. What do I do? I don't know why I said Donald Trump for president. I'm, I'm hoping that's that's our own ISIS. <laughs> Let's, whatever, fill in the blank, new president person right. becomes, uh, notice I said person, I didn't even go with woman or man. Uh, what, what would you do if you, were, if you were in a leadership position, if you were in a position to make a decision or to, uh, to start a process, what would you do? We would destroy them. You would just go right back in? We would destroy them. And you think that that's what America should do right now? Yes. Yes. 
It is a cancer that is growing. It is malignant and it needs to be destroyed. So what steps would you take? Like what, what would you do if you were in a position of power right now? You know, it's interesting. People get this idea that this is some crazy complex situation and it's going to be all hard and all this. I could pull together like two first lieutenants from the Marine Corps, which is like the junior officer in the Marine Corps and say, come up with a plan to defeat ISIS. You got two hours and they do it and it'd be a good plan. This is not a complex situation. How many people are you dealing with when you're talking about ISIS? I don't know. 20,000, 10,000, 4,000, 100,000. It's tough to tell. It, yeah, it's tough to tell and doesn't matter. You assess it, you, make, you, you bring what you need to the table and you defeat them. So what do you think is holding back from us doing something like that? I have no idea. Is it frustrating to you? Yes. Because if you got kids and you see, the, again, a malignant cancer on humanity that is growing unchecked, when we have, we're, we're like the master surgeons that have the ability to go in and eradicate this disease. And instead of doing that, we're just, we're just not doing anything. So do you blame this, the current uh, administration? Do you blame the, the climate of the American public right now, the, the political climate where people just don't want to be involved in another war or enter into another prolonged interaction? I think people are always looking for the easiest way out, and it, going in is a hard decision to make. It's a very hard decision to make, and it's be a very unpopular decision. And it would be the short-term pain that everyone's afraid of. That's what one of the things that's so disconcerting to me about drones, because it seems to me that what drones are is a way that we can avoid American casualties so people don't complain about it as much. So we send this robot in there to fly in and then launch missiles. And the good thing is it doesn't create American casualties. But the bad thing is it, it doesn't seem to be nearly as effective. It's like sort of a wishy-washy attempt in some ways at war. It seems almost like it would be something that would you would use in a, a supplement as, as well as a military attack. Like they would be a part of it instead of being the only thing that you use to try to combat these people. Does that make sense? I don't know if we have enough drones to get the job done. And they're effective, but I mean, a drone is going to take out, I don't know, 20, 20 bad guys. So that'd be a lot of drones in action. I don't know if we have that kind of capability yet, but we will someday. Yeah, well, someday we'll have a robot army and we'll be dealing with some Terminator type situation, right? Yes. But right now, it's, it's almost like uh, we need to get smacked, like something needs to happen before we hit back. And I, can't, I cannot, in good conscience, agree with you because I don't even want to say those words. Yeah. You know, it's just right. a horrible thought. You don't want to put it out it's there. It's a horrible thought. Yeah. It's a horrible thought, especially when you start talking about a dirty bomb. Yeah. You know, and like, oh, here's a sector of America that no one can live in anymore because it's been contaminated. It's radioactive now. I mean, that's real. And again, for some reason, the warning signs, which can be seen, you know, anywhere you look, we're ignoring them. I think people, I mean, speaking for myself and speaking for the people that I come in contact with, I think people are becoming more and more concerned about ISIS on a, a pretty much daily basis. I think one thing that Paris did do is it woke a lot of people up as to possibilities that something like this can happen and that this isn't the end. And this is, this is ramping up. And that if they have the kind of resources to pull off something like the Paris attacks, who knows where this is going? Totally agree with you. It is a very uh, scary time. What, what do you think is going to happen if you had a guess? What do I think is going to happen in terms of a terrorist attack in America? No, no, no. In terms of our approach to dealing with something like ISIS. Yeah, I think it's very difficult to predict the future. Not, not to be a, just a big cop out over mm -hmm. here. I'm not trying to do that to you. But there's so many different ways that this could go. And, you know, now you've thrown Russia into the mix because they took down the Russian airline. You've got a guy like Putin who is a gangster, you know, and I say that 
in both contexts of of negative and positive. I mean, the guy is ne- in a negative way. He's a gangster. That's that's like scary with his thought process. And at the same time, like props, the guy's a gangster and he's going to smash some people. You've got now Turkey in the mix. I mean, it's just a very, it's a complex situation that's getting more complex all the time. And the scariest part about it is that America is not in a leadership position. We are not influencing the world the way we once did. We are not people are not looking to us as the as the leaders they're we're in the back seat and that's scary we should be in a leadership position there's nothing wrong with that it is not bad to have a a benevolent country and and i know people are going to go crazy but a, a generally benevolent country that's sitting here you know giving billions of dollars of aid around the world never taken any soil and kept it. I mean, we've, you you know, I guess in modern times, we've never taken any soil and kept it. We've given Germany back to Germany. We gave Japan back to Japan. You know, we've, we've, we're, we're a fairly benevolent country. Again, I know we've got faults. I know we've done things wrong in the past. I'm sure we'll do things wrong in the future, but to have us not in a leadership position is a very disturbing time. And when you say that we're not in a leadership position, wh- what do you think the shift is and where do you think it happened? I think it's been happening. And I think, you know, I think the current administration is definitely not um, as experienced as you would hope. And I think there's a lot of a lot of naive attitudes about what the rest of the world is like. So this administration, you think, was the beginning of the shift away from America being in a leadership position? Yes. What do you what kind of a president do you think would change that? Somebody that has a better understanding of the nature of the world like a John McCain type guy. Yeah, maybe like a like like and I, you know again I'm not uh, to sit here and try and think of who the best presidential candidate would be. I mean, we have a hard time figuring that out in America as a whole. But again, you look at a guy like you look at a guy like Putin and you look at a guy like Obama. Um, you know, Putin's whole existence has been geared towards this, you know, I mean, a KGB guy, I mean, he's been a player on the world stage and a part of it for his whole life. And he's got an acute understanding of it. And he's a black belt, you know, he's a legit black belt. And you just see these other, um, uh, you see the, the, the naivete of, of this administration and it's 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 really hard to it's it's hard to understand. There was one thing that Obama said. Uh, it was yesterday or today that just drove me crazy. He was talking about the attack on Planned Parenthood in Colorado Springs, and he said things like this don't happen in other countries. It's like <laughs> how the fuck do you say that? Just days after what happened in Paris, I, I was reading that just today before we started the podcast. I was reading it. I was like, that is one of the craziest things that someone could say after hundreds of people were killed in Paris. Because he's talking about it in terms of gun violence from a religious perspective. That, what the fuck happened in Paris? What, because it's not about babies? It's different? Like, Yeah, and he, I mean, he said something the other day too, was uh, I'm not interested in some notion of America leading and winning. What does that mean? Exactly. That's, yeah, it's very... Uh, it's just, it's an, it's, it's very disturbing. What does that mean? That's a, what did, did anybody ask him to qualify that or? No, it's one of, you know, he was, he was kind of speaking and yeah. That's a weird statement for the guy who's the commander in chief of the greatest army the world's ever known. <laughs> not interested in staying number one. <laughs> Not, not good. I think the, the, the concept of a benevolent leader, the, of, of a benevolent nation, you know, the, the, if, you, if you do concede that the world will always be in chaos and there will always be, at least in terms of like the foreseeable future, you know, the next hundred years or whatever, we're, we're in, until something crazy happens. I mean, there would have to be something monumental, 
life changing that, that stops conflict all around the world. You'd have to, if you were a rational, pragmatic person, if you're looking at the future, you'd have to say, well, we're going to have conflict, especially if you look at places like, you know, the Congo or, you know, parts of the Middle East where people don't count. And there's, there's places where, like, you would have to educate them to the point where the future would look radically different than the present, right? So if that's the case, if the, if conflict will be something that we're, we're going to have to mitigate no matter what, wouldn't you want to be the one that gets to decide? Wouldn't you want to be the person in a position of power? Yes, you would be. It's like the is, is a much smaller scale, but this is what I've always tried to tell people when they say, why would you want to learn martial arts? And what I always say is, you don't want to learn martial arts because you want to go beat somebody up. You want to learn martial arts for two things. One, because you want to learn how to overcome incredibly difficult things. And in martial arts, you're going to encounter times where you want to quit. You're going to get your ass kicked. It's going to be difficult, and it's extremely difficult to get good at it. But two, if you do get into a situation, you want to be the one who gets to choose whether or not someone gets hurt. You don't want to be helpless. Because being helpless is a terrible place to be. But it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to go out and fuck people up. And that's sort of the same idea on a macro scale that you would look at the concept of America being a benevolent entity or a benevolent superpower. Yeah, absolutely. 100% right. You know, I mean, you know, it's it goes with everything that we do. And, and when I say we, I'm talking about you, you know, you train, you work out, you try and be strong, you know, you keep yourself aware of what's happening. It's not because you want to go around kicking people's asses. It's because you don't want to have to kick anyone's ass. You know, people are not looking at Joe Rogan and be like, oh, I'm going to beat him up right now. No, they're going, oh, that guy, I know he trains all the time. And if someone gets in your face, they're going to know that immediately. You know that when you can tell, you can tell by the, some, the way someone carries themselves, what you know what they have and what they know what they understand uh, you know i got asked the other day if you were president you know you asked me if i was got advice they said if you were president what would you do with isis and i said if i was president isis would not exist president they, jocko they, they, they would, make it happen they would not exist because we would have a presence in the world that would prevent the growth of this kind of ideology but what kind of a reaction do you think you would have from the American public, from the insulated American public? I mean, we're de we're, this is probably one of the most sensitive times ever in terms of like they, they, they throw around the term Islamophobia. If you even criticize anyone that just happens to be Muslim, I mean, we're, we're in a strange time when it comes to incredibly sensitive, maybe hypersensitive people that maybe don't have a good grip on reality. Well, <clears throat> what would you do? Take them over there in buses? Yeah, that'd be one thing. That'd but, be the way you know, to go, it's, right? <laughs> it's, it's interesting because I, I've already talked about this. Islamophobia. I mean, I fought alongside these Muslims. I fought alongside them to help them. My friends did and America did. We fought alongside these people to try and help them and we did so how that gets twisted in some world to where you know we're, we're not we're evil is completely beyond me well i think because there is legit islamophobia out there in the world just like there's uh, there's a legit hatred of christians there's legit hatred of mormons i mean there's you're going to find groups of people that are hated and there's also people that aren't willing to look deeper deeper into some some global issue if you have a global issue that there's these people that call themselves isis or isil or whatever they call themselves and you know they call themselves the islamic state you oh islam oh islam's bad muslims are bad muslims are evil i was watching something there was a uh sam harris had posted up on twitter uh there was this guy who was i believe it was in virginia he was uh at a, a like a county one of those uh, meetings where you're talking about building something in the mm -hmm. town and uh, he was he was talking about putting up uh, a mosque and these people were screaming at him that Muslims are evil and your evil cult is not going to come into our town and you're trying to invade our town and get out of here with your evil cult and like okay that's Islamophobia 
That's right there. I mean, you're talking about a peaceful guy who just wants to be able to worship his, you know, his ideas, his religion in peace in this place. He wants to build a mosque and people want to, you know, they're furious at this guy. That's real Islamophobia, right? But there's a big difference between something like that and what's going on in other parts of the world with ISIS. A giant, giant difference. And I think that, that when people want to throw around that term Islamophobia, I think a lot of times what they're doing is they're just trying to be correct. They're trying to be politically correct, socially correct. They're trying to be sensitive and they're trying to let everybody know that they're not racist, that they're not xenophobic, that they're not Islamophobic or whatever, that they're open-minded and progressive. So they're throwing around these terms and it kind of clouds the water. Okay. <laughs> I mean, fuck. yeah, uh, these are, the, these people are uh, running around calling you know islamophobia i don't know no one's ever called me that um not yet i'm sure they will get ready today uh, on twitter yeah it's I, don't, I don't see how it's happening I don't, right now yeah i don't i don't see how yeah. they could i don't see how they could do that you know again yeah uh, we we fought alongside muslim people we ate with them we put our lives in their hands and they put their hand their lives in our hands and you know America and my friends were killed trying to help them. So how I'm a, a, a person that could be called an Islamophobist is, is kind of a stretch, I think. Yeah, well, it, rationally, but you're talking about people that aren't necessarily rational. Well, you know, people paint their own layers onto things and make them into what they're not. Well, I think it's symptomatic of what's going on with with our culture, too, is that this these hypersensitive oversimplistic ideas and, and people that, that would say these things like this don't have a real grip like you have of what it's like over there. And I don't think anybody does other than people like you that have been over there and have been in combat. I don't think it's possible. I think that's one of the problems that we have. We, we're behaving like children in a lot of ways. Because we really have never had to live on our own. Yeah, and it's 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 actually very similar to what we were talking about earlier with the traditional martial arts, where you can sit there in your fantasy world and think that your chi is going to protect you, and that as long as you spread love, you're going to be protected because your chi is strong. And uh, until you've been in a fist fight, you're going to believe that. And so that, that's kind of like what you're saying. Do we need to get spanked? Do we need to get into a fist fight before America realizes like, oh, no, there's real problems in the world that need to be handled? We, we, this is a, one of the weirdest times ever, but I have a bit in my act about um, this is the first time ever where someone broke into the White House. I don't know if you know that in 2014. It was the first time anybody yeah. gained access. And there was a woman guarding the front door, it was an unarmed woman guarding the front door and a woman who's in charge of Secret Service because diversity and one of my favorite parts was there was an article written about when the guy uh, knocked the chick over, ran inside, and they said uh, it was reviewed and gender wasn't an issue. Well, we're, okay, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Like, you mean if Brock Lesnar was guarding the door, the same thing would have happened. The guy would have knocked him over, and, every, and he would have no, no one would have ever caught the guy. He just would have ran by, and that's fucking ridiculous. But it's that same kind of crazy thinking, politically correct asinine thinking you should have a fucking team if you're gonna make the president sleep in a house that's in the park you should probably have a team of fucking assassins surrounding that building at all times and you should keep a lookout for dudes that are sprinting across the lawn knocking over chicks that are guarding the front door there's no doubt about it but it's the same thing it's like we're so soft and we're so used to being in this insulated world that we have here, this nice, sweet bubble where we drive our eight mile per hour or eight mile per gallon SUVs. And I don't know how you would ever really illuminate all these problems that you're bringing up. I don't, I don't know how you could yeah. get these I mean, into in the head in of the world average II, person. Like in World War II, like you and me, if we were 13 years old, we weren't old enough to serve. We still knew that there was a war going on because we couldn't eat steak. We couldn't use any metal. We were gardening at night. We were shutting off the lights. Like we were impacted. All of America was impacted at the height of the Battle of Ramadi, the height of it, at the height of the war of Iraq, at the height of the war in Afghanistan. America, Americans, 
at the mall were not impacted at all. At all? At all. Not only that, they weren't even allowed to show photographs of coffins. It's like the first time ever in the history of the United States, the history of the United States taking pictures during wartime where they made it illegal to show photos of coffins, which is just absolutely insane. Like, how, how are you going to let people understand what's happening if you don't even allow journalists to show photographs of coffins? It's the, it's the bubble you're talking about. Same it's thing. What made you decide to leave the military? Well, a, a bunch of things. I mean, it wasn't like one day I woke up and said, all right, I'm done. Uh, you know, obviously, if, if you haven't caught this up to this point, I, I, loved, I loved the SEAL teams. Yeah. I loved being in the military. Um, at the 20-year mark, I had a, a bunch of different things that kind of weighed in. You know, I had a family that I hadn't seen or didn't know uh, pretty much. So you start thinking, well, you know, maybe I should pay attention to them a little bit. I had completed sort of my last real uh, job, operational job in the SEAL teams. And it was going to be a long time before I was in command again of a SEAL team or of something that was important from a war fighting perspective. So that was kind of kind of another thing that I looked at that was tough. And, and yeah, I just, I guess I, that's it. That's it really. So what was your transition? How long ago did you begin to get out? I got out in 2010. Wow. So it's this is yep, five years five ago. Years, five years. Yep. And what was your transition? It was, we uh, started this company where we go and work with civilian companies doing leadership and management. And, you know, my, my buddy Leif that I was talking about earlier, who is one of the platoon commanders that was with me in Ramadi. And, you know, he, he had run into a company. I had run into a company and they asked us to do some stuff. And the next thing you know, you know, I gave one, one kind of leadership training to a company and then they said, come back and train all of our divisions. And then the parent company of that company watched me and said, Hey, can you come to our CEO summit? And then went to the CEO summit. And then a bunch of those CEOs said, Hey, can you come? And, and the next thing you know, I'm doing this. So what, what is the, what is the process? Like when you're, when you're doing these, uh, these speeches or you're setting things up, how do you organize them? And what, you you obviously your lifetime was in the military right so what was it about you and about what you brought to the table that was so attractive to them i think it's because the principles of leadership and that's what we do that's what we talk about and that's what we teach is leadership the principles of leadership do not change whether your whether your mission is to capture kill bad guys or whether your mission is to manufacture something or sell something or produce something you're trying to, you, you got a group of people, a group of individuals, and they're going to be diverse. They're going to be different. They're going to have different intelligence levels. They're going to have different personalities. They're going to have different goals. They're going to have different motivations. And you got to take all those people and unify them and try and get them to accomplish a mission in the most effective and efficient manner. And that's leadership. And it doesn't, like I said, that those principles that we used in combat don't change regardless of what the mission is. And, but what's good, you know, and I said this earlier, life is like combat, but amplified and intensified. Or and, combat is uh, like Sorry, life. combat is like life, but amplified and intensified. And, and that means when, when we tell a story, like a leadership story about combat, it, it, it's so obvious what the what the principle was whereas in the business world it might take six months or a year or maybe you barely even notice what the failure was you know and when we so when we when we make those stark examples from combat people go oh oh i see how we're failing in this too and that's that's why i think people really took hold of of what we did and how we put it across so this was something that you were approached to do this wasn't like an idea that you had had and you thought about like this will be my new thing yeah and i mean re regardless of like all this uh garbage that i talk in my life and i've always telling people to, like plan and be prepared yeah i i almost completely fell into this with the fact that you know someone said hey can you come and talk to my people about leadership and i said well yeah i've been talking about leadership for you know the last several years in the seal teams and i've been in a leadership position in some pretty 
tough situations and you know that just that just happened now do you teach a course or is this uh is this like a one-time seminar type of a thing we, we do both well so sometimes we go in you know and we'll do like a keynote speech uh and those are good. Those are good. Those are great. You know, we get a lot of positive feedback about those. But then sometimes we'll go in with company and we've done like two year contracts with companies where we've trained everybody that they have and we get all their leadership aligned on the same page and and we'll we'll go in, you know, for maybe a couple an assessment, we'll look and see, we'll learn about what business they're in, we'll learn about what they're doing, how they're doing it, we'll see what areas they can improve on, we'll formulate a plan around that, and then we'll come back and we'll train leadership. That's fascinating. So you, you have to kind of construct a course. Yes, yes. I mean, the the basic, like I said, the basic principles are always the same, but some organizations have different problems than other organizations. They all They all have the same, you know, five, seven problems, you know, whatever that number is. Some of them are really bad at this or really good at this or they're failing here, but they're winning here. So we got to go in, check them out, see what see what the issue is, and then we get it uh, turned around. Is this rewarding for you? Do, you? do you enjoy doing this? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, well, number one, I can talk about combat all day long and I can talk about, and even more than that, I can talk about leadership all day long because it's, it's, it's the, it's the most challenging thing. The most challenging thing about being in combat in a leadership position is not, you know, trying to figure out what the enemy is going to do and trying to, trying to organize a good plan. The most challenging thing is dealing with all these human beings. Mm. That, that's the challenging thing is getting these guys and girls to do what they need to do, what you need them to do, to get them to believe in it, that's what's challenging. And we definitely learned lessons, positive and negative. You know, that's one thing about our book that people have got a lot of feedback is this book isn't like, hey, look what we did, look how awesome we are. No, this book is a lot of those chapters in that book are, hey, this is what we screwed up. Here's the failure that happened. This was a horrible situation and it was my fault. That's where we learn the lessons. And I think that's what's made people relate to it more because we're not just saying, hey, we're the greatest thing in the world. No, we were, uh, we were humbled by combat. We were, we were humbled by the enemy. We were humbled by our own guys that did amazing things when we were around. So it, I think that's a little bit different as well. And again, I think that's one of the things that makes pe- that appeals to the people is they look at this and they go, oh, I can relate to that. I can understand it. I've failed too. I made a mistake. Oh, how did they handle it? Oh, they did this. Okay, got it. When you're talking about combat, you're talking about people organizing and staying together and figuring out how to lead. You're talking about these extreme consequences, the most extreme ever. And when you have these extreme consequences, obviously when there's a lot on the line, people are going to focus and some people are going to fall apart and some people are going to pull together, but you're going to, you're going to get people that understand the gravity of the situation. It would seem to me that it would be much harder to impart that into people in the business world. Amplified and intensified. So in combat, lives are at stake, absolutely. In business world, have you ever had to fire anyone before? No. It it sucks. Have you ever had people lose their job and couldn't pay their mortgage and feed their kids because you screwed up as a boss? No. That's pressure. That is mass. Have you ever lost hundreds of millions of dollars worth of capital because you made a bad decision. No, but you know why? It's because I'm not a leader. <laughs> See, so there's good things in not being a leader. This is but, the, the benefits of non-leadership. <laughs> so, so you know, we, we, when people ask me that question, because they ask that question right. all the time, I'm like, hey, it's not about, it's not about lives, but it's about livelihoods. Right. And you've got people that are relying on you right. to succeed and win. And again, sure, you get killed in combat. That's obviously the worst thing that can happen. But... If you lose your job or, you, you know, your, your people lose their jobs, I mean, people kill themselves all the time when they make bad business decisions. Mm-hmm. It's that much pressure. Yeah. It's that much pressure for sure. And so that's why it does translate because business people relate to that amount of pressure and they understand how it feels to, to have that bearing down on them. It just seems to me for a guy like you that maybe you'd be even more attracted to going into business than you would be to teaching people how to lead their businesses better. Yeah. And we, I mean, it is a business. We do have a business. So, and it is definitely what we're doing. Um, and that being said, for me to now go into business, I'd have to learn some new business. Well, 
I, I, why not just take the skills that I do have, which is, you know, we know about leadership. So let's just help other people. And that is rewarding. It's, it's very rewarding to talk to someone and have them go, I did what you told me to do. And this is the result. This is the outcome. That's very rewarding. And, and another piece of it is, you know, everything always ties to me back to America. The, the, the businesses in this country are the economic power of this nation and our economic power is the backbone of our authority in the world and so to help businesses grow and achieve is is very rewarding because i know that it's uh it's a very patriotic thing to do capitalism is 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 a very patriotic piece of america that's an interesting perspective that's an interesting way to look at the big picture and i agree with you i'm going to say something that people hate me saying but i'm going to say it because I, I need to say it to you. You should have a podcast. <laughs> People always get mad at me because I say this all the time to interesting guests. But I, this is not something that's difficult to do. And you'd be fucking great at it. And I think that your perspective on the military and your perspective on our, our, our situation overseas, I think would be very unusual. Very unusual and very educated. And I just think there's there's no one out there that's doing that like like you could do it. Well, we definitely... I've I've... You're not the first person to say that to me. As a matter of fact, when Tim Ferriss, like we got done with the podcast and he pressed stop on the thing and he just looked up at me and said, you need to do your own podcast. Good for him. I've talked to some of my, I've talked to some of my, some of my buddies about it and uh, we're, we're working. We're this working. is all you have to do, man. Get a fucking phone. Do you yeah, have a phone? Yeah. Press record. You know, sit down with people. It's not hard to do. It's easy. Trust yeah. me. No, it's a, it's interesting too, and I'm I'm getting over the fact of uh, like I told you earlier, and like I like I said on the Tim Ferriss program, you know, people that just talk for no reason, mm. and it's hard for me to get used to like the the fact that somebody wants to hear what I have to say. That's not you know a seal <laughs> mm-hmm. or you know a direct business person, but uh, I'm definitely you know we're, I'll probably end up doing something with it. Well. I think, you know, great military leaders, whether it's uh, Zhao, what is Sung Su, The Art of War, mm-hmm. whether it's Miyamoto Busashi from mm-hmm. the Book of Five Rings, great warriors from the past have written books that civilians have gotten a lot out of. And I think that someone like you, instead of writing a book, and your book I'm sure is great, and I'm sure there's a lot of lessons in that, on a daily basis to be able to do something like this anytime you want just fire up your podcast anytime something like Paris like the Paris attack happens you could give your perspective instantaneously upload it onto the internet and there's just never been a time like that it's wonderful that we could sit down and read what Miyamoto Musashi wrote hundreds of years ago I mean, it's, it's amazing. It's interesting to, to, to try to peer into the mind of one of the, the greatest swordsmen that ever lived and see his philosophies on life. But I think that today, with the advent of the Internet and with, with the ability to broadcast yourself virtually instantaneously, I think you could, you could make a gigantic impact in sharing that perspective and taking those experiences that you have so deserved and so earned and and giving people this insight that there's just they're just not going to get it you know i'm getting it from you like i said i got it from you from that tim ferris episode and i'm getting it even more from you now it's a perspective you're just not going to get from someone who wasn't there you're just not going to get it you're going to get these fuzzy uh, but, you know, you know, it's it's like two people sit. You ever heard two people talk about martial arts? Don't know shit about martial arts. You know, yeah. that's what yeah. it's like to hear someone like me talk about the military. Really? Yeah, and it's it's again, it's another thing that that is uh, I'm I'm sorting out in my own head, which is this idea of broadcasting myself. Uh, it's just it's just weird. I mean, you grew up, you were into this, you know, I think you, you've been a comedian for your, pretty much your whole adult life, right? 26 years. Yeah. So 26 years, you were getting on stage. That's what you wanted to do. And honestly, when I first joined the SEAL teams, that was the most frowned upon thing was to be broadcasting yourself that you were a SEAL, right. that you were, that what you did. And it, and it took me a long time. I mean, writing this book was a, was a, it's, it's a really hard thing to do because 
you sit there and you you know you you're you're supposed to be humble, right? You're a mm-hmm. warrior, you're supposed to be humble. Okay, well, I'm going to write a big book about myself. I mean, that just that just doesn't work. And so it was really hard and and Leif and I that was one of the biggest things that we did as we edited it and edited it and edited it. We went through it just to just to make sure that we were coming across and saying things in a manner that really reflected Th- that humility, which again, it's very hard to do because it's a dichotomy. It's a dichotomy because you're saying, Hey, you got to be humble as a leader, but I'm gonna write a big book about myself. You know right. what I mean? It's, it's just, <laughs> it's just crazy. Yeah. And so when you're sitting here like, Oh, you should have a podcast. And I'm thinking, you know, you should broadcast yourself. And again, well, the way I was raised, cause I, you spent your whole adult life in comedy. I spent my whole adult life in the SEAL teams and I was raised by these old Vietnam guys that were badasses and they were like, Oh, you don't talk about this. Right. And so I'm kind of going against this, the way I was raised. And, and so again, I'm, I'm getting over it. Um, I'm trying to get over it, but at the same time, I don't want to get completely over it because that's part of, you know, that's part of the way I was raised and what I believe in. I see their point of view. I, I totally understand why they would say you don't talk about it. But what I think the benefit of talking about it today, as opposed to their time, is that through the internet, you can broadcast in a way that would be like, look, no one's going to take a Navy SEAL back in the day and give them a a, a gigantic television show where they could say whatever the fuck they wanted, (laughs) broadcast anytime they wanted. But if you have a successful podcast, you can reach hundreds of thousands of people with each episode, which is just like a successful television show. And because of that, you have the ability to educate people and give people this perspective that I said that I got from you. That I'm just not get I'm not getting from anybody else unless they've been there. But I get it from you. I get it from Tim Kennedy. I get it from Brian Stan. I get it from Andy Stump. I get it from people that have been there. Mm-hmm. And you you get a, a different perspective than you're ever going to get from someone who's just pontificating or guessing, waxing poetically on the nature of man and war. It's all bullshit. Until you talk to someone who's actually been there, you don't really understand what they're saying. I think that I think it would be gigantic. I really think you should do it. I really I really think it would help a lot of people. I think um, it would help a lot of people understand from the perspective of someone who actually knows what they're talking about. And there's not a lot of that in the world. I think this is also what you're talking about when you're talking about the leadership in this country. It's I don't I don't know if you should be someone who has served in the military in order to qualify for being the president, but I don't think it's a bad idea to throw it out there, to, to say that at the very least, you should spend some time living in these environments where we're involved in massive conflict. At the very least, you should visit them, spend a lot of time with the people who have lived and served and fought in these countries. So you understand f- clearly with no fuzziness at all what the fuck is going on in the world. Well, <clears throat> there's no doubt that I think military service, I mean, I, I, it was so good for me. It was so good for me. And but Would it be good for everybody? What, what about Jamie over there? Look at him. I don't know either. See, he just said I don't know. I'm not 100% sure. I'm Jamie. <laughs> I guarantee Jamie would get a lot out of, a lot out of it. I'm sure he would, I'm too. Gu- I guarantee he would. But he might wind up like that dude in full metal jacket with the rifle in the bathroom. <laughs> Private pile, get some. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, I, I did. You know, the military. The, the military was great for me, and and. But again, you you were born for this. I mean, this is like something you were drawn to, like a magnet to metal filings. Yeah, yeah. You know? No, I was I was drawn to it, but I, I was still like when I joined my dad. My dad said to me. Uh, you're going to hate it because you hate authority. That's what my dad said to me. I was like, okay. Uh, And you know, but that's, that gives you an indication as to what kind of kid I was. I was like completely out of control and didn't listen to anybody. And I was probably similar to what you were like, I'm guessing, Um, you know, I was just an out of control kid that just did whatever. And so joining the military, it, it put, it put the structure around me and all of a sudden I could take all this energy that I had and, and what's really nice about it is you get this clean slate where they're like, okay, if you do this, you'll be successful. Here's what you do. Check these boxes. And I was like, okay, I'm ready to do those things. And you just do them. And, 
you develop the discipline, you know, the discipline and I talk about that all the time, you know, the, the fact that discipline equals freedom and the more discipline you have as a human, the more freedom you're going to have, which is completely counterintuitive. You know, people think, oh, you're living this disciplined lifestyle. So that means you, you, you don't have any freedom. And it's actually the exact opposite. I have freedom because I have discipline. I have, I have, you know, financial freedom because I have financial discipline. I have more time. I have more time because I have the discipline to get up in the morning, you know, mm. before most normal people get up. Those are the kind of disciplines that you put into place. And those definitely get instilled through the military. Well, I think the one thing that discipline definitely does help you with is it helps you get things done. And when you get things done, when you, you, you actually do things, you, 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 you have more success. If you have more success, and sometimes a, a big part of success is just not being fucking lazy and just doing it. Yeah. Just get, that's like 90% of it is just showing up. Get there and start working. Like, you're not going to feel perfect every day. If I felt, if I only worked out when I felt good, I'd be a fat fuck. Because there's a lot of days I don't want to do it. I mean, it's pretty much the same with everybody that if, that actually gets good at something. That you you get there's got to be those days you push through, and they're they're probably going to be more numerous than the days you don't. And so the benefit of discipline in my eyes has always been that through discipline I get things done. Yeah. I always tell my I always say that I'm like the most lazy disciplined person I know because I don't want to do it. Yeah. But and, I always do. And I'd be interesting to get your perspective on this, this statement. So I also think that discipline is a, is a pathway to creativity. And I'll tell you, when I talk about creativity, there's another misconception about the military. When you're on the battlefield is an absolute exercise in creativity. Okay. I already talked about how you're going to lead these people. What are you going to do? How are you going to influence them? How are you going to talk to them? How are you going to say the right things? That's creativity. Now you throw on top of that, what am I going to do to the enemy? How are we going to attack them? How are we going to disorganize them? How are we going to get in their heads? That's all just massive creativity. And when I look at people that are artists like yourself, because you're a stand-up comedian, you, I, I would imagine that the more disciplined you are, the you know you got to get up and write. You got to write stuff down. You got to read and find out about what's going on in the world. So you have more things that you can jab at and and make fun of. You got to increase your vocabulary so that you are quicker and sharper. So that when people are saying things, you have more words to battle back at them. All those things, all that freedom that you get on stage, comes from the discipline that you you study, you learn, you read, you write, you talk, you go through things. Is that an accurate statement? Absolutely accurate. There's a great book on it. Stephen Pressfield wrote a book called The War of Art. And Pressfield was essentially like a ne'er-do-well till he was like 40 years old. He was kind of a fuck-up. And then figured it out. Somewhere along the line, figured it out. I used to keep a stack of them in my old studio, and I'd hand them out to guests if I thought they needed it. I'm like, just take this. Just trust <laughs> me. Read this. Because a lot of artists and comics... Um, I, I, be, I bet musicians as well, but we're writers for sure. One of the big problems is sitting down and doing the work. Mm -hmm. And you, you got to, and Pressfield talks about that in, in the most concise and beautiful way. And he labels it like an enemy. He calls it resistance, mm -hmm. you know, and that you have to sit down and you have to overcome resistance and that the pro goes to work. And it doesn't matter if you're sick, doesn't matter if you have kids, it doesn't matter what you, you're a pro and you go to work. And that, and that just, it puts it in your head that this is what I do. This is what, and you have pride in that. And then when you are in front of that keyboard and you're, you're, you got, you look down the count, it says, I got a fuck a thousand words today. I put a thousand words in you, you know, and yeah. you, you, you're doing the work yeah. and out of that work, gems blossom, yeah. little things, but you might have a day where you just write nothing but dog shit. So what? Show up again tomorrow and tomorrow out of that dog shit, a flower will emerge. You never know. And that's the only way to develop real like to to really develop your potential 100 percent in anything whether it's as an author or even as a martial artist there's a lot of creativity in martial arts to be a great striker you have to be creative because you have to you have to develop patterns or execute patterns that are, aren't going to be perceived like if a guy has a real simple one two one two, you're gonna time that shit. And you're gonna. We were talking before the, this this podcast about Holly Holmes' victory over Ronda Rousey, and one of the things that we were talking about was that Ronda had this very linear, straightforward attack. You knew she was coming, and Holly is a master 
at at countering. So all she had to do was wait and move, and Ronda was coming in one direction. There was no. There was there was no variation. There was no creativity. There was no creativity. It was a mad bulldog rush that had worked on everybody else before, but she found one person who was a virtuoso at movement, and she needed creativity, and it wasn't there. And she needed that experience that came with having faced someone who knew that position and knew knew uh, had a, a deep understanding of that movement, and she didn't have that in her repertoire. And so that's the result that we saw. Like a striker like Anderson Silva, he's extremely creative. If you watch, he's got a fight versus Tony Fricklin um, in Cage Warriors. Cage Warriors? What the fuck was it called in England? Small organization in England. I think was it was it called Cage, Cage Warriors. Warriors? Yeah. yeah. Where he practiced this step in uppercut elbow. Like a sideways elbow. And his coach was going, you're fucking crazy. Stop practicing that. And he would make his wife hold the pillow because his, <laughs> his coach didn't want him to practice it anymore because he thought he was wasting his time. So he practiced stepping. His wife would hold a pillow for him. And he'd step in and throw this uppercut elbow. That's what he knocked out Fricklin with. Yeah. And he, obviously, yeah. Fricklin was outclassed in that fight. But he wanted to make a point. And like the front kick that he landed in the face of Vitor Belfort, Vitor never saw that shit coming because mm -hmm. nobody had done that to him before. Because nobody had done that in the history of the UFC. Nobody had ever knocked anybody out with the first kick you learn in martial arts. But the creativity to try something like that, he would throw punches to your thigh from standing. He would throw a jab to your thigh. He would throw a crescent kick, an inside crescent kick to your face. Like, what the fuck? It was, it was part of what made him such an effective striker is that he threw these things that you just didn't expect him to do. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of creativity in jiu-jitsu. You know that. Yeah, right? well, I got, you know, Dean Lister and Jeff Glover are my, my guys. Jeff Glover is one of the most creative guys in jiu-jitsu today. Yeah. He's yeah. one of my favorite. He does this thing, for folks who don't understand jiu-jitsu, who don't know what we're talking about, he does this thing called a donkey guard. <laughs> He's so fucking crazy, this guy. He gets on, literally, he faces you with his butt to you, <laughs> and he launches himself backwards like a donkey kicking yeah. and wraps you up. And it looks so preposterous while he's doing it that so many guys, especially when he first started executing it, just had no idea what the yeah. fuck to do. Yeah. It, yeah, there he is right it, there. <laughs> Look how crazy Jeffy. he is. He's, yeah. he's he out is, of his mind. And he's so uh, he's so comfortable in every, like, you know, he trains at, you know, we're at the same gym and he trains every day with whoever. <laughs> And he puts himself in the most ridiculously horrible positions. I'm talking like, okay, he'll let people get a rear naked choke on him. I mean, he, I'll watch him. I'll be like, what, what in God's name? How is he going to? And he will escape. He'll just put himself in horrible positions all the time. Just to work on his defense. Um, just to work on his defense and just to be in, in a bad way. How does he avoid getting hurt? Because he's not a big guy. Uh, he's super, super, super flexible. Um, like crazy flexible and you know he gets dinged up but he just is very flexible and he knows where to put his body you know he's just a he's a, a kind of a freak because I knew that he trained with you I was gonna ask you like the idea of you and him training together for folks listening to this was the majority of our podcast is audio probably like 90 percent you're about what 240 or something like that yeah 235 yeah and Jeff's like what 150 yeah yeah. Yeah. What 50. the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> that's that's a big. I don't want to train. I weigh two hundred pounds. I don't want to train with anybody who's two ten. <laughs> you know, the fact that he's one hundred and fifty pounds and he's training with gorillas. Yeah. I don't know how the fuck he does it. I don't yeah, know how no, he does he's, it. Uh, he's just super relaxed and he just moves and moves really well. That's yeah. amazing. That's amazing. He, no back problems. He's he's all right. No neck problems. He is one hundred percent at all times. Yeah, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Dean's getting a little more dinged up. Yeah, know. Dean looks like he ate a Dean. <laughs> I saw him the other day. I'm like, what are you, 300 fucking pounds? And I don't mean it in a fat way either. He's yeah. huge. Yeah, yeah. He looks gigantic. He's he's pretty big, yeah. Has he just been powerlifting or something? Like, what is he doing? Uh, I think he just eats a lot. <laughs> yeah, but he's, he's definitely lifting, too. Because, like, food doesn't go right to your neck. His neck <laughs> starts a, at the he's top a genetic, of his head. He's a genetic mutant. He's, like he's another guy. He's a genetic mutant, um, and yeah, he's. I mean, both those guys are are mutants. Mm -hmm. They're actual grappling mutants. Where if you and I were to like concoct some weird, you know, like potion and create beings, you know, you'd make like a Jeff Glover because he's weird, flexible, wiry, and he would be really good. 
and then you make a Dean Lister who's just a big mutant. Who you you when you when you catch Dean, you have to like do everything perfect because he's his defense is really good and he just doesn't it's really hard to tap him with stuff you know like like he'll just give people you know his foot and be like yeah go for it (laughs) (laughs) and it takes me like three days i'll have to soften his foot up with like nine foot locks then just crank it crank it crank it and then you know on the third day i'll get a deep one and, and it'll already be like hurt so so you know, so you have to soften him up over days, up like over tenderizing days. meat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that was why it was so shocking when Josh Barnett tapped him, because Josh Barnett tapped him in like an old school side, yeah. like headlock choke. Yeah, yeah. which is uh, very rare. You know, it's very rare that you see like a high level guy that executes that choke like the way Josh did. But yeah. Josh's got that old school catch wrestling knowledge too, which is just such a, a, a different approach. And you get used to certain approaches. Yeah. And Josh has a, a very different approach. And he's a very physically strong guy as well. Yeah. And I mean, you know, Dean is just uh, Dean is a mutant and he is a gifted, incredibly gifted grappler. Um, but his, you know, his training methodology and lifestyle is not really conducive to uh, competing like that, you know, unfortunately. That's a nice way of saying he's kind of lazy. Yeah. <laughs> Let's just make those noises he, no, and not he, say anything. Hey, you know, <laughs> he, 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 he could definitely yeah. train harder. And, uh, you know, I've, I've trained with all kinds of guys in the world, uh, world-class guys all over the place. And Dean is absolutely you know, one of those guys that is up there with like, you know, uh, Hickson who I've trained with, I haven't trained with Marcelo, but he's like that crazy good. Really? Wow. And, uh, well, yeah. I know he's, he's, he was one of the first real leg lock masters yeah. really understood like, and, and, um, uh, so who, was, who brought him in to, um, into where someone brought him in to, um, ADCC Pride. No, I know he. Uh, fuck. Why am I? Why am I blanking? Alan Belcher. God yeah, yeah, damn. Yeah. Alan Belcher brought him in when he yeah. fought uh, Husamar Pajares, yeah. who's the best leg locker in MMA. Yeah. And in that fight, Alan yeah. just stopped everything Pajares threw at him and literally and beat him every down. every single movement that I saw. I was like, oh, that that's this, that's this. You know, like I knew exactly what Dean had showed him and exactly what those movements were. That's amazing. What is Dean doing these days? Is he going to still compete or? Uh, he's, you know, he's teaching jujitsu and, you know, hanging out, um, getting after it, (laughs) you know, uh, I would love to see him just like get completely refocused and make a, make a run at winning ADCC or whatever, uh, one more time before he, before he hangs it up. Like but, when you say he's dinged up, like what kind of shit? Like, oh, just normal old, you know, jujitsu type guy. You know, he's, his neck will be sore, his shoulder will be hurt. Uh, just that kind of stuff, you know. But, but you know, he is a mutant. He is a mutant that could, you know, if I think uh, he, he, in ADCC, his last, I think it was in China, the, his, his match against Buchecha, when Buchecha is just a complete beast. And, you know, they went at it. And that was a very close match. And again, if you watch training videos of Buchecha getting ready for ADCC, he's training like a complete savage. I mean, he's bringing wrestlers in, he's clean and jerk, he's flipping tires, he's doing everything that one does to prepare for a situation like that. And and Dean does not do those types of things, you know. He'll come in and train a little bit and go on his natural ability as a mutant human being to get it done. It's always frustrating when you see a guy who is so naturally gifted who kind of like lays back. But that's, it seems to be, that's a lot of what happens is the people that are well, naturally gifted don't have to work as hard, so they don't work as hard. It's, it's also part of, you know, when I talk about Jeff and Dean, both those guys, they're both, and you know, you could throw Eddie in there, you could throw all kinds of people into this category who are, who are uh, kind of game changers, you know what I mean? Well, you know, I don't know Eddie that well, I've hung out with him a couple times, but I definitely know Jeff and Dean, and they're they got some they got some some weird stuff about them right i mean they got some weird personality stuff and in from my perspective that is you know no if you didn't have that weird personality thing then how are you going to be you know a 15 year old jeff glover and be like oh you know what i'm going to do all day i'm just going to train jujitsu all day every day 
I'm going to yeah. sit there. I'm going to watch YouTube videos. I'm just going to get good at this. I'm going to train every day. I'm going to compete all over the country. I'm just, that's what I'm going to do. That's, you know, if you're not some, if you don't have some, if you're normal, you're not going to do that. A right. normal person's like, oh, cool. I'm going to get a job at Walmart and then right. I'm going to do it. You know, I'll train it. I'll train for an hour and a half a night. These guys are like, oh no, no, I'm just going to train all day, every day. And I'm going to live in, you know, on the mat. And Dean, same way. Like how, how if he didn't have that weird like spark that made him that makes him i mean he's got some weird like knowledge what's weird about him is if you ask eddie bravo about you know the rubber guard he knows all this details about it but if you ask him about a footlock or what something that he doesn't know that well he'd be like oh yeah a little bit you'll ask dean about something that he knows nothing of like you've never seen him do before and he'll know all these detailed of the moves and I don't know if he I seriously don't know if he goes and watches it on YouTube or if he like studies or writes it down but he's got this weird little almost rain man um, you know idiot savant type weird thing in his head he was one of those guys that had a really hard time transitioning into MMA absolutely his yeah. striking yeah. just never seemed fluid like yeah. and he you know I know he worked hard at it he just uh, for whatever his body is designed to for choke grappling. things yeah. yeah and you see that with everybody because everyone's got strength and weaknesses and everyone's gonna be good at something and bad at something else uh you know you and i know all these examples of people that are like this every fighter you know has got some weak area and then you get occasionally mm -hmm. you get a guy that like gsp that's just like well-rounded right um but you know everyone even even things physical things physical attributes you know some people are just super mutant strong mm -hmm. and some people are just super crazy flexible and some people have unbelievable natural cardio and some people don't and so it's the people then there's some people that are really good at grappling there's some people who are really good at striking there's some people that are good at putting all those things together which i always thought fedor was very natural at combining his striking with his grappling and kind of making it all fit together better than most people could yeah um yeah i agree with you on that i think that was one of the things that really stood out about him was that he didn't fall into that trap that a lot of people do where if you're a, a really good wrestler but you have knockout power you just knock everybody out mm -hmm. fedor he would be you'd be stunned and he would see your arm and he would dive in a kimura yeah you know he would he would always take the opportunity that presented itself whether it was a grappling situation or whether it was a striking situation yeah. and his well-roundedness was one of the things that made him special on top of his knockout power and his aggression his he was so well-rounded it yeah. was his ability to flow with whatever was happening and he also had that hum humility mm -hmm. and he had that calm like you saw like you saw holly had the other day yeah. and i actually i actually again talk about social media i posted i don't i haven't posted much on face the facebook before but there's a video of holly uh talking about she got beat by Sophia Matthias in kickboxing, right? Mm -hmm. It was a vicious fight. Watch it later. Was it kickboxing or boxing? Yeah, kickboxing. It's 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 insane. I mean, she gets destroyed. Mm -hmm. Holly gets completely destroyed, hanging on the ropes, getting punched in the head. It's awful. Then you watch the post-fight interview with her, and it it it's unbelievable because everything she says, she takes complete ownership of the loss she's like i had a tra great training camp i my coaches were telling me to do the right things but i wasn't doing what i was supposed to do i wasn't fighting the way i was supposed to fight the reason i lost tonight is my fault i did this and i will have to change things if i'm going to beat her and that, hearing someone and the other part that was cool about it was she was getting emotional like you could see like she wanted to cry i mean she was crushed but she she kept control of her emotions and was another you know when i saw that video i'm like man this girl is is gonna do gonna do well in this fight i mean i i, I had a pretty good feeling about it well she's she is incredibly solid that's for sure and that is so admirable when someone does take ownership of their mistakes yeah it's so important it's so that, important. That, that's like we wrote the book. The book is called Extreme Ownership. That, that's that's literally the Bam, title, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> right there. But but that's that is like the key. The, the reason it's mm -hmm. called that is because when we made mistakes, we owned up to them. And furthermore, when both Leif and I ended up in positions where we were teaching leadership, Leif was teaching the junior officers that were coming out of the SEAL training, putting them through the, the junior officer training course. And I was teaching, like I said, the advanced guys. And so you'd get two 
SEAL officers. And like I said, we put these guys through horrible training scenarios where everyone was getting killed and blown up and they'd be buddy carrying people through the desert. And just, it's just awful. And you come back from these situations and you talk to one of the, let's say one of the good leaders and you'd say, Hey, what went wrong? And the guy'd say, well, number one, I didn't give a clear enough plan. No one really understood what my vision was. They didn't execute because I obviously didn't give them a good enough briefing. And you'd be like, okay, fair enough. And that guy would go and fix that problem. Then you'd get a guy that was, would not take ownership of stuff that would come in and say, uh, you'd say, hey, what, what, what went wrong? That training, you know, that, that was, you guys did a terrible job. What happened? He'd say, well, you know, my, my assault force commander didn't wait for my command before he left and he screwed up and my platoon chief wasn't heads up about where our casualties were being taken and my LPO and they, they'd make all these excuses. And it really was the difference between like who would be successful and who wouldn't be because the guy that takes ownership of the problems, wh what do you think the rest of his team does? Just, just if if that person takes ownership of the problems, everybody on that team does the same thing. They don't say, yeah, you're right, boss. It is your fault. No, they go, hey, boss, you know what? I actually could have done a better job. And and that spreads through everybody. Yeah. Whereas when someone says, hey, it wasn't my fault, it was Joe's fault. What does Joe do? Joe goes, no, Fuck it wasn't mine. Yeah, exactly. And then you get into you, we argument. blame each other, yeah. and guess what? The problem never, never gets, gets solved. Fixed. Exactly. Yeah. So to hear Holly talking about that after the fight and taking complete ownership of a loss was very impressive to me. And she went on to beat her like six months later, yep. I believe. Yep. Yeah, that it's one of the most important things in getting good at anything is recognizing when you're not good. Recognizing when you make mistakes. Yeah. It's, it seems so simple, <laughs> right? But You know why? Because ego. Oh, ego's a monster. Everybody's ego. Yeah. It's like even, even me, because I sit here and I, I like teach people about, you know, you got to keep your ego. Mm -hmm. There's a chapter in there like, you got to keep your ego in check. When, so, when, when somebody, I'll even ask somebody, I'll be like, hey, is there anything I could have done better in that, in that speech or in that class? And they'll be like, well, you know, one thing that you could do, and I, like immediately I'm like Fuck bristling you. up. I'm like <laughs> bristling like my ego. And I'm like, God, I'm such a loser. I, I'm sitting here telling them about to put their ego in check, and I'm an idiot. So everybody does everybody that. Everybody does it. does it all the time. No one can take criticism. And, you know, part of that biggest step of moving forward is, uh, is, is learning how to take ownership of stuff when it goes sideways, and it definitely will. Well, you need some form, some amount of pride and some amount of ego to get good at things in the first place because it's, it's such a count, counterintuitive notion because you have to have a belief in yourself. You have to be able, like when you, when you first, when you start out at jiu-jitsu, you're a white belt. Like, I remember being a white belt and being like, oh, my God, I am fucking never going to get good at this. I'm going to suck forever. But to, 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 to look at people who are better than you and know they had to have sucked at one point in time. Okay, there's got to be there's somewhere along the end of this tunnel, there's got to be a light. I just got to keep going. Yeah. And uh, that no, takes no. ego, and, and right? Ego, yeah, I was going to say, I mean, ego drives you know you to be successful me to be successful ego is what's driving you the problem is when you let ego go too far yeah and you know everything you know everything takes balance I mean, there's a dichotomy in everything every part of you has a dichotomy you know you can get so into the physical aspects of things that you end up like doing a bunch of steroids and going crazy and ruining your health right yeah. that's that's not good right the other end of the spectrum you know you can sit around and play video games and turn into a yeah. Yeah. Well, there, there's, yeah. Bodybuilding is the best example of that, right? Is, because is, yeah, that's, it's kind of dying out though. Isn't it kind of bodybuilding? I don't like, think full so. On? Is I would, it full on out there still? Well, to you and I it is, but yeah. I think there's a giant culture of people out there that want to look like huge mutants mm -hmm. still. Right it's, it's, I think, I, I mean, guess. I'm not in that world, but yeah. when I mean it, bodybuilding is a great example of that because when you start lifting weights, you're like, God, ah, I'd like to be stronger. And you start getting a little bit bigger. You're like, oh, look at that. I got a muscle. Woo, this is cool. And then you keep going, and then you keep going. But some guys get so fucking crazy, yeah. they won't stop until they have 22-inch arms. And they want to have thighs that are so big, they have to walk like they're, they've got a barrel in between their <laughs> legs. And, you know, and they, they just can't help it. They just take it to some completely unhealthy place. Yeah, that's uh, rough. Yeah, well, it's, it's just... 
the nature of trying to get good at something. You got to recognize what's good and what is just fucking insane. Yeah, and it happens in training camps with fighters all the time. Oh too, yeah, right? overtraining. Just overtrain so it's a bad. Big big part of problem of, of the problem with uh, with mixed martial it's arts. So obvious too when you're mm -hmm. overtraining somebody. Because all of a sudden, like one night, they'll just fall apart and they just mm -hmm. won't be able to do anything right. And I'm always like, all right, go eat two steaks and take two days off, you know, yeah. because they will get to a point. You just feel them. You'll just feel them fall apart. Yeah. Well, you have to monitor your heart rate. That's a big thing that a lot of fighters don't do. Monitor your resting heart rate in the morning. And if it goes up more than five beats in a day or two, most likely you're overtrained mm. or you're sick or you're struggling with something that, that would make sense. Steve Maxwell taught me that trick. Yeah. He's yeah. like, every fighter should do that. None of them do. They should monitor their heart rate. And every morning his heart rate is like seven. Yeah. Steve <laughs> <laughs> Maxwell can fucking, he can deal with anything. Yeah. He's just one of those dudes, but he's just, he's another guy. You want to talk about a guy who's got a lifetime of yeah, wisdom for sure, for when sure. it comes to strength and conditioning and what he calls physical culture and the culture of, you know, taking care of your body. This yeah. guy's 62 or 63 years old, fit as a fiddle, travels all around the world training people. That's all he does. Doesn't have a house. Yeah. Doesn't He has a, 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 a bag yeah. that he brings with him. When he, he travels around, all of his stuff's in that bag. Yeah. He's I ran into freak. him in San Diego because he's been downsizing. Like he, And when I the first time I ran him into him in San Diego, he was down to living in like an, an RV, like a small yes. RV. That's when and, I first met him and too. And <laughs> I, I hear him on a podcast, whatever, you know, a year later or two years later, and he's, no, I have all my worldly possessions in a backpack. Yeah. He <laughs> sold his RV and he's like, fuck it. I don't even know if he has a bank account. I mean, yeah. I, he's, just, he's a strange cat, man. Yeah. He really is a strange cat, but a very at peace guy. For sure. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's very interesting. I wouldn't want to live like that. I don't like living like that. But he's also been the guy that's lived the other way. He's had the house and he's mm -hmm. had the family. And his son, Zach, is a, a very successful jujitsu yeah. competitor and, you know, got divorced and gave up the gym. He had the, all the all the trappings. He had everything. And he's like, mm, I like it better like this. I like backpack life. And maybe the key word there was trappings. Yes. You know, maybe he somehow built all these things around him that felt ended up feel, making him feel trapped. Yeah, for him, it's just he what he he figured out what he enjoys. He enjoys training. He's still doing jujitsu to mm -hmm. this day, and he teaches a course, uh, jujitsu for lifetime, and it's all about maintaining your health while you train. And you know, he's written articles on training smart yeah. to avoid injuries as you get older, and you know how to pick the right training partners and make sure you know you know nobody's trying to hurt you, but that you could keep a an active martial arts lifestyle <clears throat> deep into your sixties, yeah. like he is. Yeah, you got to be thankful that you started jujitsu a little bit younger because you got to get. And even today, if you start jujitsu as an older, like we have all kinds of older guys coming to the gym, um, and it's that first like year, yeah, where they just don't know where to put their body yet, and they don't know to they don't know to say no to that twenty one year old juiced up marine that's like in there to get after it and, yeah. and like they smack hands to roll and this guy's yep. gonna tear them apart and that's that's how guys get hurt if they're if they're older and you know they, they you need to ease into it a little bit pick yeah, your you, training partners carefully you gotta pick your training partners carefully and this, there's always gonna be the guy that hurts people there used to be this giant german dude that used to roll at our gym he used to always get everybody in leg locks and blow their knees out yeah. and he's just yeah. I, I was you know never rolled with that guy i'm like eh. i've uh i've been leg locked by dean i don't even know how many times like i mean we might be talking thousands of times uh, heel hooked, knee locked, but you know, I've never been hurt, you know, and I've, yeah. I've gotten him, you know, not thousands of times, but plenty of times. And we've never hurt each other, you know, because we, we know what we're doing. Yeah. I'd way know? rather roll with a black belt oh, for sure. than some fucking psycho blue belt. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's just too dangerous. Sometimes they just, too, they spaz out and they yeah. headbutt you accidentally and yeah. weird shit happens. It's, um, um, w one of the things uh, that I think is uh, amazing is uh, that Anthony Bourdain has gotten crazy into jujitsu over the last, I think, two years now. He just earned his blue belt. He's 59. Yeah, that's awesome. Which, it's amazing. He, he Lifetime of smoking cigarettes, doing heroin, <laughs> like never, never was fit, never exercised at all. When I first met him. Uh, like he would laugh about fitness. He just wanted to dr drink beer and, you know. He, he the first time he did my podcast we got so high I don't even know how we talked <laughs> and then uh, I just did his TV show like a couple weeks ago we were in Montana 
all he wanted to talk about was jujitsu. Yeah. He's obsessed. I'm showing him some techniques. We're talking about different guys that like to do different things and different approaches and Gi versus no Gi and John Donaher and, you know, Gary Tonin and Eddie Cummins and all these different. I'm like, this is amazing. I can't believe yeah. like you. What a transformation this guy has overtaken. Jiu-jitsu definitely. I mean, people can get into all kinds of weird stuff, right? People get into surfing. People get into skiing. People get into rock climbing. There's definitely something um, more in jujitsu that gets into people's heads. Yeah. And it definitely happened to me. I mean, I was completely, and I still am. I mean, I still cannot like stop a YouTube video of a cool move. I mean, I just, <laughs> I just have to watch it. Yeah. And I think it's because there's such a cerebral part of it. There's something about it. And I see this, you know, we teach kids. And you'll see the, the, the knucklehead kids, the kind of knuckle dragon kids are kind of big. They, they don't really get it. But then you get this kid, like some smart kid that you can tell they're smart. And those are the kids that get really into jujitsu because yeah. they realize like, oh, if I learn this, I can beat that big kid. Yeah. And that's where it starts. But yeah, jujitsu can definitely be addictive. Well, jujitsu is the only martial art where it really works like in the Bruce Lee movie. Yeah. Where the little guy really can beat the big guy. Yeah. Because yeah. the reality is, like, if you watch the old K1 days where Bob Sapp was fighting, when Bob Sapp was 375 pounds with abs, like, you've never seen anything like it. He, it, it, was he on steroids? He was <laughs> steroids. There was nothing human left. And he beat Ernesto Hoost twice, who is arguably one of the top two or three greatest kickboxers ever. And Bob Sapp just bum rushed him and Donkey Konged him. Just beat him down with clubbing punches because he was so much bigger than him. Yeah. He was more than 150 pounds bigger than him, probably. I think Hoost at his biggest is probably like 230, maybe. Or and something to, like and that. to your point, I was in Japan. I was with Dean, as a matter of fact, when Nogira submitted Sapp. That was insane. That was insane. That was insane. That was a perfect example. Perfect example. But, but boy, it had to be Noguera, though, because oh. Sap, Sap dropped him on his head, pile drived him on his head. I saw him the next day, Noguera, like after the fight, and he was hurt. I mean, he was beat up bad. Oh, my God. He his, took some abuse. His neck was fucked up apparently forever after that. Like he, he, His neck essentially never recovered yeah. after that fight. You know, that was one of the fights that Fedor passed on. Fedor wouldn't fight Bob Sap. Uh. It's like, nah, you can take your fucking clown show. Yeah. Take your circus act. And no gear is uh, yeah. like, okay. Yeah. Fedor was like, no thanks on the freak show. I'm, yeah. I'm going to fight. But then again, he went and fought Hong, Hong Man, Man Choi, Choi yeah. who's a giant guy too, but giant, actually gigantism giant, yeah, yeah. not giant like juice to the gills giant. But look, Bob Sapp, I mean, all power to him. They didn't have a law against it. And he went in there and they were paying him. And that's how he made a ton of money doing that. But the point is that in jiu-jitsu, like maybe in MMA, it's a little bit different because, you know, obviously Bob Sapp dropped Noguera on his head and yeah. most people would have been done then. Mm -hmm. But Noguera was legendarily tough. But a small man can tap out a much larger, stronger man on a regular basis. Yep. I watched Rico Rodriguez in Abu Dhabi go against Marcelo Garcia. Oh, yeah. I was there. Were you there? Yeah, yeah. in L.A. Yeah, yeah. 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 it was awesome. amazing. Yeah. So, and when Rico threw him on his back, when yep. Marcelo took Rico's back, Boom. so Rico threw himself backwards and slammed on top of Mar like like Marcelo's like a backpack on Rico's back. Rico's like two forty something, maybe even heavier. Threw himself backwards and landed all his weight on Marcelo. Mm -hmm. Marcelo shook it off and leg locked him. Yep. Incredible. Yeah, incredible. Incredible. I mean, Marcelo was like 160 pounds, yeah. maybe 170, maybe. Yeah. But just so skilled and so dangerous with his jujitsu that he was the favorite in that, yeah. which is incredible. And that's, that's where I think that addiction comes in because I think mm -hmm. it's just a cerebral thing where people realize that it's, like you said, it's this real force. When I, one of my, uh, my, my kid asked me, you know the movie The Incredibles? You yes. Know, I don't know, there's kid, these people have superpowers and my... Uh, my son asked me, hey, dad, is there really such a thing as superpowers? And I'm like, jujitsu. It's definitely a superpower. It's a superpower, you know. And if you remember the days before anybody knew it, if you oh, knew yeah. a little tiny bit, man, you were just <laughs> getting, you, no one could stop you. It was awesome. Well, it's also amazing to see the progression of jujitsu in comparison to 1993. Because the jujitsu of 1993 was so primitive in comparison to what you have today. Yeah. 
like the guys who are winning with jiu-jitsu, God, the, the setups were so obvious. You could see the arm bars a mile away. There was nothing crazy or weird about it. And you look at that in comparison to today, like a Jacare. Like when Jacare gets arm bars, it's like a work of art. I mean, you, you watch yeah. his setups, you go, good Lord. Yeah. Like he tapped Chris Camozzi with an arm bar, and I watched the transition, the way he controlled them on the ground and the scramble to arm bar. I probably watched it 40 times in a row. I just played it back and forth and went, fuck. Yeah. One more time. Fuck. <laughs> I need like perfect placement of the shin and the knee, the pressure, the hips, everything's in place, the control of the arm. It was a, it was a done deal from the moment he started his movements. Yeah. You know, that to me is like, that's just as beautiful as any painting that anybody's ever made. There's no a, doubt about 100%, it. 100% there's an art to that. No doubt about it. <laughs> what year did you start? Uh, it was 92 or 93. Damn, you got in yeah, early. I got in early. Luckily, I, I had a... Pre-UFC. Well, yep. We we knew. When, when we watched that first UFC, we all knew. Well, wow. There was, there was three or four of us that knew that Royce, that Royce Gracie was going to win. Royce. It. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing, yeah, man. We had wow. this old... Uh, this old SEAL Master Chief, old Vietnam era SEAL Master Chief named Steve Bailey. And he was he was like a high level white belt. And he had trained with Lorraine Gracie up in the garage, you know, up in Torrance. And so he knew, you know, he knew jujitsu. The garage, yeah, the infamous yeah. garage. Just like and, the epicenter of yeah, jujitsu. No kidding. In America. It's crazy. Yeah. And but this guy, Steve Bailey, had trained there. And, you know, one day we were over on deployment over in Guam and he said, Hey, who who here wants to learn how to fight? And I'm like, Hey, I want to learn how to fight. And he just took us all and just choked us all out, you know. I mean, like, okay, you you attack me and just choked us all out. I'm like, okay, I'll listen to whatever <laughs> this guy's saying. So so he taught us, you know, the basic, you know, like the rear naked choke and I, I, the arm lock and like the Americana or something like, you know, we're talking like four or five different moves. And with those moves, like I never – I. I Every scrap I'd get into, you know, I'd just force someone into the rear naked choke or force them. Into the, but they had no idea what was happening. So it was actually right. amazing. But uh, but again, I thought at that time that that that, that was jujitsu. Like that it was this finite thing. And, A lot of people did. Yeah. And then you realize, you know, that it's completely unending and it changes every day. John Jacques Machado had a guy that moved to black belt and uh, he was a very good martial artist he was very physically strong this guy he was a big like bulky dude like a naturally big bone strong guy mm -hmm. that gave people a lot of problems and then decided and like like didn't just decide this but said it publicly i've learned all i can learn about jujitsu and now i'm going to learn all i can learn about muay thai and everybody just went oh dude we're done with you <laughs> like it was like it was so ridiculed in the jiu-jitsu community and in the people in john jock school that everybody like i was like a blue belt at the time and i was like what the fuck is this guy on <laughs> like you learned everything how can you learn everything there's no end yeah. jujitsu yeah. doesn't end yeah it goes on forever like you can't get you can always get better it's yeah. not it's not something it, until you achieve the speed of light yeah. like <laughs> <laughs> and that's another another great thing about jujitsu is because it like combat it reflects life and if the day you start saying that you're good to go like in leadership position or whatever task you're working on the day you say i've learned everything there is to learn about this is the day you start to lose and i, I know that humility um is something that you you have to keep yourself in check because yeah. again, I got asked the other day. You know when were you? At, you know when was your high point of leadership? And I'm like, I never had a high point of leadership. I was always trying to learn. I was always trying to figure out what I was doing wrong and what mistakes I was making. Because if you don't do that, that's pro that's something I learned from jujitsu. You know, if you don't do that, then that you're going to get passed by, and other people are going to figure some new way of doing it, and you're going to be left in the dark. Yeah, I, as much as I like to use like the term that was perfect, there really is nothing perfect in human beings. There's always room for improvement. There's always a shorter path. There's always a quicker victory. There's always a there's there's uh, there's always new things to learn. And as soon as you start thinking that you've mastered something to the point of 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 an end, like you've you kind of missed out what it's all about in the first place. 
It's all about, you're constantly uncomfortable. You're supposed to be constantly uncomfortable. Yeah. And then in, in these little victories that you get, the good thing about when people tap, you get, a, oh, I get a little nice feeling right here. Yeah. I get, and then I did they're it like, right. let's go again. And they're like, ah, oh, fuck. <laughs> Back to being uncomfortable. Yeah. And there's no getting around. And then he taps you and you're like, ah, shit. Yeah. I should have quit while I was ahead. No, no, because you're missing the point. The point is that it's a, it's a long path, a long, arduous path. And I think anything that's worth doing is probably like that. Uh, there's no doubt about it, and, and that's another another piece. Again, another place where jujitsu is like life is y- you think at, at some point you think you know, like you think you're good, you think you're doing pretty good, and then you just get smacked. Mm. You know, you get smacked with something. And uh, like now, like when you were 25, you were like, I'm pretty, I'm pretty good to go. You know, I'm pretty, I pretty much know what's up. Mm. And then when you're 30, you're like, I didn't know anything when I was 25. Yeah, I was an idiot and five then, years ago. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and it's true. Like even, and so I think one of the one of the things that provides some small portion of like maturity as a human being and as a man is when you get to the point where you actually realize that you don't know everything and you're like looking at yourself like I'm 44 and I'm like, yeah, I'm going to learn so much in the next three years, five years. And I'm going to mm. look at myself at 44 and go, yeah, you see how stupid you were then? And when you come to that realization, I think that's a, pr- a pretty positive thing because it takes a while to figure out that, hey, you don't have everything figured out. You're you're pretty stupid right now, even though it, you don't think so. <laughs> Another thing that things like jujitsu teach you, and I say jujitsu, but it's really a, a, an all martial arts thing. The problem with the other martial arts, other than jujitsu, is at a certain point in time, you can't really practice them 100%. Yeah. Like striking. Yep. You, you really can't practice striking 100% for very long, or your brain starts to give out. It's just yep. a fact. Yeah. And jujitsu, you can. Jujitsu, you can do it deep, deep into your 50s. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's like, a, or Anthony Bourdain, he's pushing 60, he's still doing it. And, you know, it's not that he's going to be a world beater, but he can get the most out of it. The most that he can get out of it, it's, 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 that stays the same. Like, what you get out of it stays the same, regardless yep. of your, uh, r- regardless of the success. Like, what you're getting out of it, even if you're getting tapped, what you're getting out of it is doing your best and overcoming and improving upon what your best is every day. And doing so in a, a, a situation where there's extreme consequences. You're going to get strangled. You know, you're going to get your arm broken if you don't tap. You're going to get your leg fucked up if you don't tap. There's, it's not as extreme as combat, obviously, but it is as extreme as you can get in a, a sport that you're participating in, an activity that you're participating in uh, voluntarily in America at 5.30 on a Tuesday, where you're going to get 30 people that are going to show up, slap hands together, and then then hug it out after it's over, and uh, go, you're going to be here tomorrow? Yeah, all right, I'll see you, man. And then, you know, back again tomorrow, same thing. That's another um, kind of primal piece that makes jiu-jitsu so intense is if you and me roll, like, and I get you, or you get me, and I tap, in my, like, heart, I know that if you and I were fighting for survival, I just lost, and you would have killed me. And I see this with little kids. When little kids compete, you tell them, hey, listen, just go out there, have fun, it's going to be fun, you know, just go out there and do your best, I don't care if you win or lose, just go out and have a good time. You tell them that, you tell them that, you tell them that. If they get tapped... They, they start crying. It's so emotional. And why is that? Because a part of them inside their head that they don't even know exists knows that that person, had they been in a mortal struggle, they got beat. Yeah. They got their ass kicked. Yeah. It's not like someone, this is what I always say, like somebody dunks a basketball on you. Yeah. It sucks, but it doesn't mean anything yeah. unless you decide it means something. Well, well, what does basketball escalate into? What do all fights. sports, <laughs> all sports escalate into fights. Yes. So if you, let's get rid of the bat, the yes. ball, whatever else, let's just fight. Let's just, that's why it's, you know, that's why the, I think the UFC has been so highly successful because it is, it's what it's, it's the ultimate, you know, in combat sport again, you know, 
barring combat itself. Yeah, well, it's also why the dorks and pencil necks hate it so much because they think it's a regression back to the, the primal days of caveman <laughs> combat. Like, what are we supporting? Some fat fuck wrote an article for like the New Yorker or New York Post or something like that about the Ronda Rousey loss, about how barbaric and disgusting it was and what a, what what bullshit that we were fed and that you know we were made out that she was this unconquerable and to watch her beaten unconscious was disgusting and you don't get it man like you don't get it like what you're doing with your fat face like shoving cheeseburgers down your mug is way worse than anything that she did inside that octagon it, it, it's interesting because that kind of attitude can can cross borders into other things and you know i i, I end up talking to people you know, through through our company, people that are smart. I mean, uh, every like yeah, I'll be in a room with everyone's went to an Ivy League college and been super successful, and they're worth millions and millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars. And I, I was given one of these talks the other day, and we, you know, of course, they ended up asking me about ISIS and and all that. And as I'm sitting there looking, and I, and I'm thinking to myself, like these people are all looking at me and thinking. I'm just a, a, a savage, right? I'm just like, hey, I'm a knuckle dragger. We just need to go kill everyone. And so I tried to explain to them. I'm like, listen, I almost, I almost feel ashamed to say this to everyone here because everyone here is an intellectual and is very, very smart. But there are some problems in the world that there is not an academic solution to. And sometimes violence is the solution. And again, there can be a million arguments against that. But the reality of it is in the world, it's like you were talking about earlier in the world, there are evil people that do evil things. And the only way to stop them is to confront them and destroy them. And unfortunately, it, we, we are so disconnected from that. That it makes people look at UFC and go, oh my God, how could that happen? And it makes people look at, you know, a military attack and say, oh my God, how could that happen? It, it can happen because we're human beings and we're imperfect and there are, there are evil people in the world. Well, the people that think there's no ever, there's no excuse for a violent solution. Take those people, bring them to Ramadi right now, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, how do you deal with evil when it exists? How do you deal with it? Do you, do you hug them? <laughs> do you knock on their door with flowers? What do you do? I mean, what is the solution? Yeah, you destroy They them. don't have an answer. They have an answer. The only reason why they even have that attitude is because they live here in this sheltered environment, in our beautiful bubble mm -hmm. that we call the United States of America. That many brave men and women have provided and will continue to provide regardless of what is said about them. And... Uh, God bless those folks out there on the wire. Yes, sir. And with that, extreme ownership. That was three hours, man. We just banged out three hours. Damn. Crazy. Right here, Jocko Willink and Leif, Leif, Leif? Leif Babin. Leif, Leif Babin. Uh, extreme ownership, how U.S. Navy SEALs lead and win. And uh, Jocko is on Twitter. Jocko Willink on Twitter? Is that what it is? Jocko Willink. <laughs> and uh, what is it on? Um, do you have anything else? A website? Uh, well... Yeah, we have we have a Facebook for extreme ownership. We have an extreme ownership Twitter. Um, yeah, we're out there in the social media world broadcasting ourselves. And and soon a podcast, right? And I will I will do a podcast. He's gonna see. I knew yes, it. I will do I a knew podcast. It. It's gonna happen. Echo Charles, be ready to record a po podcast, brother. Thank you very much, sir. This was awesome. I really, really appreciate Thank it. You. And uh, I will put up a link on Amazon after the podcast. So go out and buy this book, folks. Thank you very much, Jocko. Appreciate it, brother. Thanks for having me on. Woo!